It's 9 a.m. live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's your morning rundown. It is crunch time on the Hill. The Senate has a bipartisan short-term deal in the works that would push back a government shutdown. That's according to reports. Assuming the Senate's bill is passed, pressure is on the House and Speaker McCarthy to get it over the finish line. We will be speaking with former vice president and current presidential candidate Mike Pence at 10 a.m. Eastern time about all this and more. Plus, making the picket line presidential, Biden heads to Michigan to join striking UAW workers. He's not the only 2024 hopeful making the trip. Trump is expected to make an appearance on Wednesday. And it's carnage in the bond market. The 10-year yield hitting its highest level since 2007 yesterday, lifting the dollar on its way up. The sell-off coming from investors spooked by the Fed's higher for longer message, who fear that another interest rate is on the table before year's end. Well, let's get to today's morning driver. J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon is warning that the U.S. economy may not be prepared should the Fed raise interest rates to 7 percent. The big bank leader told the Times of India going from zero to 2 percent was almost no increase. Going from zero to 5 percent caught some people off guard. But no one would have taken 5 percent out of the realm of possibility. I'm not sure if the world is prepared for 7 percent. And so Let's really wrap our minds around what 7% would mean in actuality, especially in an environment currently where we've already seen some of the forecasts come through as of right now for a uh, potential recession in the next 24 months here, or excuse me, 12 months here, um, sitting at about 60 to 65%, that coming from the Federal Reserve Bank uh, of St. Louis. And so you think about all of what would need to take place in order to make that happen. You'd have to see a further collapse in consumer confidence and consumer spending as well. You'd also more than likely see a large tick up. We've already seen economists calling for as high as five to five and a half percent in the unemployment rate as well. So the much more kind of dire conditions that would come about should we get to a seven percent that would then eventually firmly put us, I think, and many others out there in that position of, well, when do we cut and how quickly do we need to cut as well? Yeah, exactly. That totally changes the scenario right now because base case still at this point is very much for a soft landing. You mentioned mm -hmm. the unemployment number at least today at 3.8 percent. So if we do, in fact, see rates go as high as 7 percent, as Diamond was warning, could potentially be a possibility. That obviously is going to change the dynamics right now within the economy. And you're right, as it stands right now, many forecasters or I would say just shy than the majority here, I still think that we are going to be able to avoid a recession, but we're starting to hear more and more calls for another rate hike. We just heard from the Fed's uh, Kashkari yesterday saying that when you take a look at the economy right now, he sees a scenario where we are going to need to hike one more time, at least here, in order for things to cool off. And he said, quote, if the economy is fundamentally much stronger than we realized on the margin, that would tell me that rates probably have to go a little higher and be held higher for longer to cool things off. So I think everyone's trying to figure out exactly what the Fed needs to do if they need to do more in order to get inflation under control because, yes, we have seen a pretty steady decline, although it's been a little bit bumpy uh, over the last month or two yeah. uh, in, in in inflation. But now the question is what needs how, what needs to happen in order to get to that 2% target, which the Fed has reiterated time and time again. Yeah, and it's going to come through the tone, the tenor of Fed Chair Jay Powell and his communication when he takes the lectern time after time again after all of their policy meetings. But Perhaps the minutes will give us a little bit more of clarity around how the discourse, how the discussion is taking place here, especially as we are sitting right now through fresh projections recently saying and showing that 12 out of the 19 officials, they were looking for another hike this year. So all of that considered, the dot plot as well as the meeting minutes beyond just what we hear directly from the mouthpiece of the Fed could be amazingly important to keep an eye on as well going forward. It certainly will. All right, well, let's talk a little bit more about the bond market and the bond market carnage. The 10-year Treasury yield edging lower this morning, but still hovering near its 16-year high as investors brace for rates staying higher for longer. Now, the recent surge in yields also putting pressure on equities, the S&P 500 down about one and a half percent in the last month. And the tech heavy Nasdaq, that's lost over two percent. Here with more, we want to bring in Gargi Chaudhary, BlackRock head of iShares Investment Strategy. Gargi, it's great to see you here. So let's talk about the moves that we've seen in the bond market. Right now, we have the 10 year yield still above four and a half percent. When you take into account the warning that we got from Diamond, maybe what could be ahead for Fed policy? What does that mean for the bond market? 
Sure. Good morning, Shana. Great to be here on the show with you and Brad. So, you know, to your point, I was listening to your show earlier, and I think we all are wrapping our heads around the higher for longer theme. The bond market certainly is. We do believe, and we actually put this in our fall investment directions, which is our Q4 outlook that we released yesterday. We do think that the higher part of that equation has happened. So it's unlikely or it's uh, we believe that we've already seen the last hike of the cycle. Now we have to uh, sort of come to terms with the longer. The higher has happened. Now it's for the longer. And the Fed is telling us that the longer period will be at least till the sort of second half of 2024 before they start considering cutting rates. And I think the reaction that we saw from the Treasury market over the last three or four business days was a ramification of that recognition of high of longer, but also, of course, a recognition that the supply that's coming in the Treasury market is very heavy, um, as well as the growth data that continues to look very, very uh, positive. Yeah, Gargi, I was reading some of the key takeaways from your fall investment outlook, and particularly what struck my attention was the highest conviction trade, which continues to be fixed income. Why mm -hmm. is that and how, for how long could that continue to be the case? Yeah, and I think it's uh, important to specify where in fixed income, right? So right now, you know, the entire piece that we've written is sort of focused on quality. So high quality fixed income, and then where in the duration part, so where in the interest rate sensitive portion of the yield curve, do we think there's most bang for your buck? And we think here that the belly of the curve, so think about the three to seven year, really focusing in on that five year part of the curve is where investors should be allocating to, whether you want to do that with treasuries, which are with an ETF ticker like IEI or the AG, whether you want to look at tips with something like TIP or even SDIP, or whether you want to own mortgages with MBB, all of that gives you access to that high quality and belly of the curve. Where we want to still stay away from is what you and Shana were talking about with respect to the tenure or perhaps even longer. There isn't enough term premium built in yet. We think the longer end of the yield curve can still move higher, the yield curve can still steepen. But the belly, which is, again, that five-year point of the curve, uh, is looking very attractive right now, especially if you think about the coupon income that you're generating. So if you own the five-year point of the just the treasury, you don't even have to look at spread, spread products. And if you mm -hmm. own it for the next 12 years and rates go up by 100 basis points, you are still going to make money. Of course, if they go down by 100 basis points, you're going to make close to about double digits. So those are some really good asymmetries that we like here. Gargi, if we do see the U.S. government shut down, if there is a deal that's not uh, reached here on Capitol Hill within the next couple of days, how much risk does that then add to the market? Because Moody is coming out saying that, hey, if we do yeah. see the government shut down, then that could potentially hurt the U.S.'s credit. Yeah, I mean, listen, we've already unfortunately had two rating agencies that have already downgraded the U.S. Obviously, a third one will certainly be news, but I don't know to what extent the uh, Treasury market or even the equity market is going to react any further. What I think we should all focus on is not so much about the known unknowns. I think at this point, the uh, government shutdown, if it does indeed happen, is sort of a known unknown. But I uh, spend a little bit more time thinking about the unknown unknowns, really, and what those could be as it pertains to uh, both the equity and the, uh, and the bond markets. And I think with the government shutdown, as long as it's sort of a short period, a shorter shutdown, if you look at the history, it's you know, sort of averaged around eight to 10 days. Uh, of course, there's going to be an impact to GDP for that eight to 10 days period, but that GDP does come back once the government reopens. So I think we have to keep that in mind. But what I would be much more concerned around is how does earnings season play out what should we be thinking about with respect to oil prices and the ramifications of higher USD on other parts of the world, certainly the emerging market economies. And so, Gargi, with that risk present of a, of a potential shutdown, we're going to be tracking towards that date and all of the other things considered. We're about to close out the third quarter of 2023 and, and staring down directly the fourth quarter here. What's your top idea with some of the risks that you mentioned still at play now that we are entering into and about to enter into the fourth quarter? 
Sure, Brad. So, you know, as we lay out in our guide, we talked about the fixed income side of the market already, but within the equity markets, number one, stay high quality. So what does that mean? We like looking at companies that are that have strong profitability, low leverage. This is really important in a higher for longer environment with interest rates. Low leverage is important. Uh, you know, so lo looking at quality companies within sectors, we like energy. We actually just opened an overweight to industrials. Uh, uh, and then we also think that away from the U.S., I think uh, looking at certain stories in international uh, markets is really important. We think for demographic reasons, India looks really attractive here. We also think looking at emerging markets, ex-China uh, could be something that's attractive to investors between now and the end of the year. All right. Really interesting stuff and, and great analysis and perspective as always. Gargi Chowdhury with the BlackRock Head of iShares Investment Strategy. Gargi, great to see you this morning. Great to be here. Thanks. Well, switching gears here, Ford is pausing construction of an electric vehicle battery plant in Michigan until it's confident it can run the factory competitively, the automaker saying that. In February, Ford announced the plan to build the plant in Marshall, Michigan, planning to employ about 2,500 workers to make low-cost batteries. We spoke to Ford CEO Jim Farley about the car batteries earlier this year. Take a listen. Batteries are the constraint here. It won't be the manufacturing site behind me. Uh, and, and, and the lithium ion batteries that we use, um, both lithium and nickel are really the key constraining commodities. We normally get those from all over the world, from South America to Africa to Indonesia and Southeast Asia. We want to localize that here in North America, not just the mining, but the processing the materials. Actually, even if they're mined, let's say in the US nickel, most of it is sent back to China to get processed. So. The big change is going to be to onshore all that capability of processing, but also mining back here in the U.S. It'll be a huge job, just like it has been for semiconductors. And for more on Ford's latest move and what this means for the UAW, we've got Yahoo Finance reporter Pras Subramanian. Hey, Pras. Hey, how's it going, Brad? Yeah, so that plant there, Ford pausing development on a $3.5 billion plant in Michigan, like you mentioned. Uh, Ford saying the company said it it's, has concerns about competitively operating the plant. Uh, Ford declined to say what specifically changed recently on that thinking, and the company hasn't made a final decision on the plant yet. Note that, I want to note that Ford is also, they're partnering with CATL, China CATL, to make these batteries, license their, their tech. So it's possible that guidance might have changed from the government as to whether they can get the credits that they were, were seeking by making these uh, batteries there. But I want to, I want to note that, um, you know, the UAW pounced on this, claiming the move was to punish the union, union jobs because of labor costs. Uh, Sean Fain sent a statement in part, this is a shameful, barely veiled threat by Ford to cut jobs. Now they want to threaten us with closing plants that aren't even open yet. We are simply asking for a just transition to EVs and Ford is instead doubling down on their race to the bottom. So some strong words there by the UAW. When we don't even really know why exactly they're pausing development on this plan. Well, Pras, we of course are continuing to follow the latest coming out of the UAW strike and President Biden heading to the UAW picket line uh, later on this afternoon. In terms of what this signifies, how significant this is, what do you think this means here to the UAW strike and really for the workers? I mean, it brings a huge spotlight to Michigan and where President Biden will be picketing with these with these uh, UAW workers for about a couple hours starting at, at noon today, Eastern time. There was some confusion before earlier. The president's plans were not known until late last night. Uh, a lot of a lot, which is sort of um, sort of odd for these planning to be so last minute and also sort of up in the air with the White House pool sort of uh, complaining about where they're going to be tomorrow. But it's gonna, turns out he's going to be in Michigan tomorrow, tw uh, today at 12. Not exactly sure what site. There's Ford's Michigan assembly plant that, that is currently on strike there, and potentially some auto supp uh, supplier parts distribution center. So anyway, th the fact that he's there is a big deal. First, first sitting U.S. president to be at a picket line, a UAW picket line. So this is a big deal for that. And don't, don't forget, tomorrow night, President, uh, former President Trump is going to be speaking in front of some uh, workers there. So Biden sort of had to maybe jump ahead of, the, of, of, of Trump to kind of shore up his base with union workers because it was concerned that Trump was going to go after him. Yeah, both trying to appeal uh, to a block of voters, which are very key in this swing state. All right, Yahoo Finance reporter Pross, super menian, thanks. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. We'll be right back.
always hope, and uh, I don't believe believe in a no-win scenario. Like we understand what what a shutdown means uh, to the government, to the American people. Uh, I certainly do not want that, uh, and so we also have some other Republicans on the more moderate side that uh, certainly don't want that. It's an interesting situation. I hope that uh, during this weekend we can come to some solution and come back and work it through. The odds of a shutdown are increasing. Modern, mature governments should not be shutting down. Uh, it's uh, certainly a crazy impact, probably an impact on the markets, an impact on the economy, an impact on all of the government operations essential to keep uh, society humming along. And right now, the House is talking about going out for five days and coming back next Tuesday. And at that point, they would just have till midnight Saturday to work out a continuing resolution. So uh, things are looking worse than they did a couple days ago. The real problem right now is Speaker McCarthy uh, continues to be really um, led around uh, by a very far right uh, extreme contingent in his caucus. Um, Look, at the end of the day, uh, if Speaker McCarthy agrees to put up for a vote in the House, the kind of bipartisan proposals that we're sending from the Senate, I'm confident that they would pass. Uh, the question is whether um, he will put the country before his own interests uh, and, and move forward in that way. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Shauna Smith with Brad Smith, and we are about 12 minutes until the opening bell. Jared Blickery standing by for a closer look at some of the moves that we're looking at this morning. Jared. Yeah, this is looking eerily like yesterday morning. In fact, I've been, I've been remembered two down days like this when, where we have two potential down gaps back to back in quite some time. Might be some interesting stats like that um, that I'll look at into the morning here, but let's take a look inside the sector action. Uh, it's been all about the bonds, and we'll get to that in a second, but I just want to show you these green backgrounds. That's what happened yesterday for the most part. We got a couple of red ones in there too from Staples and Utilities, but those little boxes there, down 0.29% for XLV Healthcare, all of that is showing that all of the sectors today, all 11, are in the red. And if we take a look at our leaders, not really that much of a better story. We got a little love for cannabis stocks and defense stocks. Those are actual defense stocks, not defensive. 
uh, high quality, or excuse me, liquid IPO, so a little bit of green there. But you take a look at the NASDAQ, we've been suffering some pretty big losses, not only in tech, but also related fields like communication services, consumer discretionary, mega caps not faring well. Apple. I've been charting Apple over the last uh, few weeks, and it's really just hugging this uh, lower support line here. But it has not cracked that. Uh, the, excuse me. It hasn't cracked that boundary just yet. And if we take a look, I did promise the bond market here. I want to take a look at volatility as well. This is the ICE B of A Move Index, and you can see we are launching off of these lower levels earlier in September. But now we are heading higher. Bond market vol volatility is heading higher. The ten-year is hitting uh, the highest levels that we seen since 2007 as we've been talking about here. Here's a shot of the 10-year T-note yield. It's very difficult for equity and for fringier investments to do well when there's such upheaval in the bond market. And so that's what we're seeing. We're seeing all of this just kind of play out and shake out. And then we have the U.S. dollar index. Dollar not moving too much higher today, but you can see over the last three months, it has really been just trending steadily higher. That also puts pressure on things. So can the market survive all of this? Of course. But let me round out the conversation with a couple more heat maps just to show you what's going on here in the pre-market. We can take a look at the energy sector right now. We can see some downdrafts in there. Exxon Mobil down not quite half a percent. Chevron down about seven tenths of a percent. Here is the banking sector. But you can also see some weakness in, in sectors like industrials and transportation as well. So again, all these little red rectangles that we're seeing here, flashing red, that means we're probably going to see some red background squares on the open, guys. All right, Yahoo Finance's own Jared Blickery. Stay with us for the opening bell in just a little bit here. We do have some movers that we want to check in on, though, pre-market before we get to that opening cross here. DraftKings, we'll start things off there. DKNG, ticker symbol, you're seeing it move higher by about 3.6% this morning. JP Morgan upgrading the sports betting company's rating from neutral to overweight. The firm also raising their price target from $26 to $37. They're saying that the brand is seeing improved loyalty and higher amounts of betting money that the company retains here. They said specifically that they stand to benefit from a continued increase in market share from higher hold rates driven by a parlay mix and better risk trading and improved loyalty from brand recognition, trust, and some product enhancements as well. It's certainly a pretty bullish note here from JP Morgan when they're talking about where, where they see DraftKings stock going. They talk about how it is an attractive valuation right now. This stock has been under pressure over the last several weeks since peaking back in July 28. Shares are down about 16% through the close of yesterday. So JP Morgan laying out a bullish case for DraftKings. You talk about their first mover, second mover advantage here when it comes to this space, the fact that they are among the leaders when you take into account that they're number two behind FanDuel. And they still think despite the increase in competition that we're seeing from Fanatics, that we're seeing from ESPN Bet, they're saying that they still think that a name like DraftKings is going to be able to maintain much of their market share and also compete with some of those bigger names, much like they have with Caesars in the past. So that price target here, when you take into account what JP Morgan is looking at at this point, their longer-term price target obviously higher than what we are looking at today, the 2024 price target of 37 bucks. That's replacing their previous target of 26 bucks a share. And you take a look at the buy and hold sales on the street. It's a pretty bullish call overall when you take into account there has been some hesitation around some of these sports betting names. DraftKings has 22 buys on the street, zero sells, and 11 holds. And a question of where that hesitation comes from as well. And of course, you'd be right to think back to, well, is a consumer going to have the propensity to gamble, to spend as much into a platform like a FanDuel, like a DraftKings, like uh, an ESPN uh, bet product? And for right now, at least in the equity valuation, the way that JP Morgan is looking at this and continuing to uh, really evaluate the opportunity going forward here, they're taking a look at this company and saying that they've traded at an equity value to EBITDA of about 18x on a two-year forward basis since the beginning of 2022, and that they're currently trading two turns below that. So that baked into some of the bullish sentiment here that you're hearing from the company, uh, but continuing to think that this is appeal an appealing sector with attractive same store and new market growth prospects you're hearing from the, the firm here and their DraftKings upgrade. All right, well, now that we're in the midst of football season, we're talking about sports betting. We're also going to talk about some wings because wing stock shares on the move this morning, up nearly 2%. This coming after Stiefel upgraded the stock 
from hold to buy also upped its price target to 200 bucks a share. A couple of reasons that Stiefel is now bullish on Wingstop. They talk about the menu and promotion innovation within the company, growth in deliveries, also their growth in their ad market, ad resources. They think that that's enough to drive some of the same store sales momentum that they are expecting to see here over the next several quarters. And also Stiefel going on to say that the company's growing scale translates into better visibility into long-term food costs. And we know that that's very very critical when you take into account obviously how higher prices have certainly been a challenge to some of these names. So you got to get out to Wingstop. Are you fan? I'm going to throw some cold water on this because really? uh, yeah, they're saying Wingstop's unique flavor profile. I'm not sure who their official wing tester is over at Steve Ford, but I'd like to have a word with them. Um, the unique flavor profile, customizable menu appeals to a broad demographic. Sure, no doubt. If you've got uh, a bevy or a multitude of different flavors or sauces that you can throw on it, the sauces are going to taste great, no doubt. But it's the juiciness of the wing that always really catches my attention here. And this is not perhaps the first choice that I would go to. However, I have tried it on many occasions here. We've also been able to try their chicken sandwich. Uh, that was a chicken sandwich as well. Um, a significant opportunity to benefit from greater brand awareness, though, and that really gets you back to the strategy, the model that this company has, which is significant. Significant developmental potential and highly franchised business model, 98% franchised here. So good sauces. The wings could use some more juiciness, in my opinion, but it's enough to keep here. you coming back, though. Yeah, it is. I guess so. Right. Well, from time to time. Yeah, if somebody's serving it, I'm not going to deny <laughs> it. Why not? Well, let's pivot to the beauty industry. You can't eat this. Cody shares, there are, and if you are, that's just wrong. <laughs> Cody shares moving lower this morning by about 3.4%. This comes after the company pushes ahead with selling 33 million new shares as part of a seeking um, of, of a dual listing on the Paris Euronext exchange. Now, this is subject to France's market regulator approval. The past couple of years for Cody has been plagued with some management churn and heavy debt as well. The company hoping that this is going to solve their cash flow issues here. And so uh, we're taking a look at shares here on perhaps the just dilution and offering of more shares um, that are, are moving lower here, at least in U.S. trading as of right now. Yeah, certainly. So we're seeing some movement here on the stock this morning. And it's important to point out that we've seen a similar type of move from other luxury good uh, producers within the space. When you take a look at LVMH, L'Oreal, Hermes, all trading on Euronext Paris. So Cody certainly following suit there with that selling 33 million shares, like you said, worth about 389 million dollars. Now, in terms of what they plan to do with this, they're going to hold a call uh, later on this morning talking about the price, uh, talking about, I guess, their plans here going forward. But then, of course, we're going to get the price in terms of the offering before the market opens on Thursday. Some speculation just about what they're going to do with it when it comes to debt, when it comes to future mm. CapEx plans, when it comes to future investment opportunities within the space, because it certainly is very competitive. I was just listing off some of the other names that are already listed on Euronext Paris. When you're taking a look at LVMH, L'Oreal, Hermes, it's a crowded space. Yes, consumers are still spending, especially luxury consumers. But of course, you always have the overhang as to how long that could really last. Absolutely. This is some of the context around this, too, for Cody here. It's actually been a, a pretty good story as of right now for them raising uh, most recently. And it was actually just last week that we heard from them. This time last week, they had raised uh, their outlook for fiscal year 2024. They were pointing to some of the momentum in their prestige business, strong beauty demand. Hey, it's me. Prestige free, uh, fragrances as well. So people out there just wanting to smell good and not funky. And Cody's blockbuster innovation drive upside to the first half of 2024 and their fiscal 24 outlook. That was some of the catalysts that they were pointing to when we heard from them this time last week perhaps taking some of that momentum as well over to the Euronext exchange. Yeah, fragrance is certainly a massive hit there for Cody recently. All right, let's take a look at the automotive sector. And for that, we're looking at Fisker, that stock on the move, up 6% right now. Now, the EV maker saying that it is on track to hit its delivery targets this year. The company expecting to deliver 300 vehicles a day later this year. They also went on to say that they have built 5,000 Fisker Ocean SUVs today, Fisker has delivered over 900 customer vehicles in its European and U.S. launch markets. And Brad, this is a stock that had been under pressure most recently. When you take a look at the results that they posted last quarter, the fact that they have been struggling with some supply chain challenges. They had to cut their full year guidance. They delivered just over a thousand oceans, well below what they had initially uh, projected there. So it seems like that at least they expect to gain 
uh, some momentum soon. Yeah, the business of delivering oceans. I mean, that's got to be a great meeting to have when you're over at Fisker. But let's talk about the price range just briefly here. $69,000 roughly is for that Fisker Ocean Extreme. Um, and it comes down to the mile here. The, the mileage range that it has is about 360 miles on a standard, um, which is the longest range of any new electric SUV in its class, they say. And so that's going to be potentially interesting as they look to the broader automotive customer market here and try to sell in to that experience. And certainly a couple of names that we're going to keep on our radar as we look to the opening bell on Wall Street and doing a quick check of the markets. This is sponsored by Tasty Trade. Now markets opening here as investors are still bracing for what is likely going to be a more aggressive Fed. Some warnings out from Neil Kashkari yesterday saying that the Fed might be forced to hike again in order to get a better handle on inflation. And of course, the comments coming out from JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon talking about the potential scenario of a 7% rate. Let's get over to Jared Blickery as a closer look at some of the moves that we're seeing. Jared. Yes, I'm looking at the S&P 500 sector action. You can see all 11 sectors in the red, though. The worst off communication services, followed by real estate, energy, consumer discretionary, and financials and material. All of those are underperforming here. Um, so I don't know that there's a rhyme or reason, but just a lot of stuff is getting sold off. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ 100 and just a few spots of green and not, gray, not bright green or dark green at that. Gilead up 1%. Uh, Apple down 7 tenths of a percent. I was tracking that in the pre-market. Let's see what it's looking like on a three-month chart. Still did not cracked that support level, but right there at the Rubicon, we've been tracking uh, the losses in Amazon over the last five days, this big slide right here, but it looks like it's getting close to potential support over the last three months. For its part, Alphabet down 1% and the list goes on. Taking a look at the Dow, I don't expect much difference here. Walmart just barely in the green here. A couple others treading water, but for the most part, we're seeing a lot of red. And if I delve into some of our leaders, we can really see a story unfolding here. Korean stocks, uh, that ETF is down over 2%. Gambling, solar, um, emerging markets, China. So all of this just speaks to the fact that it looks like there's uh, just not a very risk on flavor to the markets right now. A lot of the fringier parts of the market getting hit the most, which is kind of what you'd expect in a downdraft. Now, here's the energy market. This has been a bright spot as of late, not today. You can see F Exxon and Chevron down about one, uh, seven tenths of 1% there. If we look inside the tech, uh, tech sector at semiconductors, a lot of red on this particular screen, but not dark red. We're seeing NVIDIA down half a percent, Taiwan Semi down there, TSM, that is down 2%. If we take a look at software, now these two different uh, industry groups can trade independently of each other within tech. And right there, we're seeing a couple of green squares, Z square, Splunk, those are uh, just slightly in the green. For, for the most part, we're just seeing a broad-based sell-off. Uh, if I go to some of the uh, some of the machine sectors that I call them, transports and industrials, also seeing a very situ a very similar situation right there. And uh, let's see if I can find any green. Sometimes defensive sectors like uh, healthcare, for instance, we will see some green. I already talked about Gilead. That's right there. That's up one percent. Um, and Eli Lilly just barely in the green. NVO Novo Notordisk Novordisk is up eighteen percent over the last three months and showing some gains for today. But uh, that's about all I got in heat map land. And I just want to end on a on a short brief analysis of the S and P five hundred. We have already cracked three months support here, so we are heading lower. You take a look at the small caps. They did that a few sessions earlier, and then you take a look at the VIX. Things are heating up there. We're at an 18. Not a disaster, but then I take a look at the VIX of the bond market, the move index. That has been heading up as well. So just uh, a little bit of risk off flavor to the markets, and we'll have to see what happens into the close. But really interesting, another down day to begin. That's two days in a row here. All right, Jerry, thanks so much. Certainly some pressure that we're seeing across the major averages this morning. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market sites. Keep it right here. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard 
landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this and we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. Stocks are lower today as markets trend towards a losing month. But our next guest saying that despite the, quote, jinx zone of October and possible volatility to come, there's still great opportunities out there for investors. We want to bring in Kenny Polkari. He is Slatestone Wealth Management Chief of Market Strategist. Joining us now, Kenny, it's great to see you here. So certainly many reasons for investors to be a bit nervous right now when we talk about what the Fed is going to do, this higher for longer scenario, also the looming uh, sh uh, uh, showdown, I guess you can call it, inside the Beltway over the government shutdown. Why should investors still be optimistic? Well, listen, first of all, well, first of all, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, you need to be optimistic because I think you have to look through a lot of, of what's right in front of us, the noise, and a lot of it is noise. Like, like you know, the chaos of Capitol Hill, while it's all dr very dramatic and is creating headlines, it's not going to price stocks in the long term. It will, though, create some potentially some short-term opportunity because as the market gets more negative, whether it's that, whether it's the UAW strike, whether it's concerns over the Fed, whether it's higher rates, you know, asset managers will use big name stocks to raise some cash, not necessarily because the stories and the, the fundamentals have changed, just because they need to raise cash. And so a lot of good names end up getting dislocated in that in that process. And so therefore, that provides a longer term opportunity for an individual investor, a retail buyer that sees, you know, Microsoft's down 13% already. Look, down another three or 4%. I think you got to start backing up the truck because it's Microsoft. Where is it going? It's down, you know, if it's down 15 or 18 or 20 percent, to me, that's a huge opportunity for the long term investor. Yeah, but in your Substack this morning, you're not talking about Microsoft. You're talking about a different AI company and Amazon here. 
Why is that? Why the prioritization there? Uh, and we'll well, get to the well, in that case, because in, because Anthropic, Microsoft, I mean, Amazon made this announcement that they're going to spend four billion dollars on this on this AI technology from this company called Anthropic, which is a privately held company. So you can't play that one yet. Although I'm sure it's only a matter of time before that comes to the market as well. So the only way you can really play that if you play through Amazon, and that's what you saw yesterday. People buying rushing in to buy Amazon it was up nearly two percent, one point seven percent yesterday. So you know, for for investors that are looking for the opportunities and specifically in the AI space, you have to play what you can play with unless, of course, you're able to get in on on, uh, you know, on the venture deals. But for the average investor, they're not. So you have to look in other parts of the space if you want exposure. And look, I think we've talked about it before. AI is really common almost in every industry out there. So you're going to get AI exposure, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in banking, whether it's in fintech, whether it's in you know Amazon and consumer and, and, and retail, you're going to get exposure to AI. But yesterday's announcement was um, significant enough because they came out talking about how their cloud computing division uh, is seeing huge demand for AI. And we all know this. AI is very much in its infancy. So if you want exposure to it, you have to find the places where you can. Anthropic at the moment, you cannot invest directly in, but you can do it by jumping on the back of Amazon. Kenny, how much of the excitement around AI, when we talk about the AI frenzy, obviously the, one of the big drivers of the market at the start of the year, is it still going to be a big driver as we look at into the end of 2023 and then ahead to 2024? Yeah, you know, listen, I think AI is very much in its infancy. So I think this AI story is just beginning. So whether or not, we're not, we may not see the same surge higher in the last three months of the year that we saw in the beginning of the year, but I think the AI story has just begun. So it's not a place that people should say, oh, well, you know, this game's over, let's move on to something else. I think that's a big mistake. I think you have to continue to stay involved in AI. Maybe you're not, maybe you're not chasing it the way people were chasing it earlier in the year. Give it a chance to kind of retreat. And I actually think you may see that, and you've already started to see um, some of those names pull back like C C3.ai, which is a, which is kind of one of the names in the space, had really a tremendous move early in the year, but it is now backed off. Um, but it doesn't mean that the game is over at all. I think AI needs to be part of uh, really now a core, it needs to have a core place in everyone's portfolio, depending on the percentage is going to depend on who you are, right? You're 35, I'm 62. So the percentage of my portfolio is going to be different than yours because you've got more time than I do, right? I'm on the back nine, you're still on the front nine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I, I'm, I'm I'm hoping that I'm still in the driving range warming up, Kenny. Uh, okay, well, gotta, from, I, I, I think you're still you in front too. nine, too. I'm certainly not on the driving range. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kenny, we got to talk about one area that, that perhaps, you know, is, is, you know, moving from kind of the hype of AI to the, the slippery slope that oil is on right now. And as you yeah. think about cuts, at the same time that we've got booming production in the U.S., how are you kind of running the calculus around that potential trade? So listen, I'm, I'm a bull on energy, right? I think energy is going to go higher. I've been long energy. I've been talking about energy. Uh, and I think that uh, there's still a demand for energy. I, I think the, the news, and I put it in my note this morning about, uh, you know, the U.S. is now going to get back to 2019 levels when we were the biggest producer of oil. We're going to produce 13 uh, a million barrels of oil daily, which brings us back to that 2019. All that, and we're doing it with less rigs, by the way. And all that tells you is that demand is strong for energy, for oil, for fossil fuels. So this idea that you know they're going to talk energy out, and they're going to force everyone to buy electric. How do you think they're going to charge electric vehicles? They need energy to charge to create the electricity to charge electric electric vehicles. So I'm big on energy. J.P. Morgan just came out. They see they put a bullish note out on energy. They think uh, you know in 2023 we're going to see better than $100 a barrel in oil and higher in 24 and 25. The Saudis have growth projections on energy demand building. They see China. You know everyone's talking about oh China's not really recovering. That's baloney. China is buying more oil and yesterday I put more coal. Uh, to, as they try to become more energy independent. So I'm bullish on the energy story. I'm long energy. I like it. I'm long the big names, ExxonMobil, Chevron, Halliburton, Summerjay, names like that, um, because I because I think I think energy is another place that you have to have in your portfolio as a core holding. All right, Kenny, we got to leave things there on the day. Uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about the butternut squash risotto at a, at a later time here, though. We got the recipe <laughs> the next time I come to New York, I'm going to come in studio with you. Well, please, but don't bring it unless you're you un, unless you have got something in hand. I mean, we, you we have go. You have a kitchen in the studio. 
No, we don't have a kitchen in the studio. Not yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, when you Maybe get a we'll kitchen, we'll be requesting one soon. Yeah, You're, just bring the corset with you. All right, Kenny Pokari, <laughs> Slate Stone Wealth Management Chief Market Strategist. Appreciate it. See ya. All righty. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Goldman Sachs analysts and top executives from across the technology, media and telecoms landscape are gathered in San Francisco for its annual Communicopia and Technology Conference. Next door is doing some pretty cool things on the AI front with their assistant and also with Vitality. For us, it actually starts to unleash unique data. We are the local knowledge graph. So I think the value of what we do starts to really shine forth. We're the only platform where you're finding out what's going on around you locally in real time. So with that data, we can do things like on the platform, help a neighbor compose a post in a way that is more engaging. So the assistant or the AI actually does that for you. There's lots of interesting discussion we can have around AI. So we announced just this morning, uh, Zoom AI Companion, which is our answer to how generative AI is gonna be included in our platform. And there's all kinds of really cool features that come with that for our paid subscribers. There are things like Chat Compose, if you're in a chat thread and you wanna be able to respond to that. There are things like Meeting Summaries, which after the fact help categorize and, and capture not only what happened in the meeting, but also the true sentiment. I think any creative would admit that AI is transformative to how they think about and how they concept new ideas. So I think it's gonna be very exciting. It's still early innings and we gotta figure out how to do it right. There's a lot of hype in our industry. I think this may be underhyped. I think it impacts things at so many levels. It impacts how we interact with computers and how they seem personal. It generates how art and media is created. It, it's a really a breakthrough in computer science and it impacts not only the products, but it impacts how software is created. There certainly needs to be a lot of debate about AI and journalism. 57% of newsroom jobs in the United States have been lost. We're facing uh, another wave, in this case a tsunami potentially of job losses uh, because of the impact of AI. And, and these are not ju just jobs lost, but it's inside lost. It's important that all media companies uh, understand the impact, but also it's incumbent on the big AI players to understand their impact. We launched Intuit Assist. Uh, and Intuit Assist is really a personalized, intelligent uh, assistant in your pocket. Uh, it's also uh, powered by AI-driven human experts uh, so that when you are getting assistance from Intuit Assist, if you ever need to talk to an expert, no matter what it is that you're doing, you're able to do that. So there's always a gateway uh, to help. AI is gonna change this whole industry completely. And so we're thinking a lot about how do we use AI to match people a lot better um, and to support the conversations that are happening. I think conversational AI is also a big opportunity because people do produce all these messages. So helping them craft those messages, make it easier to communicate, I think is, is something people will really appreciate as well.
Welcome back, everyone. We're live from the NASDAQ market site. And today, President Biden will head to the UAW picket line, joining striking workers in Wayne County, Michigan. Biden, who types himself as the most pro-union president in history, will be joined by UAW President Sean Fain. Biden's visit marks the first time a sitting president has joined striking workers on a picket line. Meanwhile, Donald Trump is planning to host an event in suburban Detroit with auto workers on Wednesday, the same day as the second Republican primary debate. To date, the UAW has declined to endorse a 2024 presidential candidate. With more on why this is worth keeping on your radar, we've got Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. Hey, Rick. Hey, guys. Uh, this is definitely unusual for Biden to go to a picket line. Um, and I have a feeling the White House is going to be emphasizing the vigor of the president and look at him walking around out there. Who knows how long he'll stay? Probably not very long. But, uh, you know, they're, tr they're definitely trying to get across this idea that Biden has plenty of energy. So what if he's 80 years old? He has more energy than most 60 year olds. So look for that. Um, there are three constituencies here that really matter. There are the striking auto workers. There's the union leadership, and then there are the companies and their leaders, the CEOs. And I think what you're going to hear from Biden is I think he's going to be conciliatory toward everybody. I mean, that's sort of the Biden brand, right? He's the bipartisan president. He can work across the aisle. And I think that's going to be very different from what we hear from Trump uh, tomorrow night. Trump is not going to be on a picket line. He's going to be giving a speech, so a very different dynamic. And I think what Trump is going to do, he's going to try to establish solidarity with the striking workers, but he's going to attack the union leadership, and he may attack the automakers themselves. So Biden's going to go, I think, and try to make nice with everybody, and Trump is going to go and try to stoke this war even further. Rick, when we talk about the mixed messaging that we're likely going to get here from Biden, or maybe their approach is the better way to put it, from Biden versus Trump when he speaks tomorrow, Obviously, we know Michigan, a very key swing state, obviously, ahead of the 2024 election. When it comes to what the union workers want to hear, what are they going to be listening for? Because if you look at history as a guy, they have typically sided, obviously, with Democrats in the past. Yeah, I mean, so I think they want uh, each of these guys, both the president and the presidential candidate, to, t to lobby for them, mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, to maybe move the needle a little bit in terms of pushing the automakers uh, for General Motors and Stellantis to give the auto workers what they want. They might get a little bit of that from Biden. The thing, the thing with Trump is Trump has a beef with the UAW leadership because the UAW endorsed Biden in 2020, not Trump. Uh, the UAW, I believe, has always endorsed the Democrats, so that's not even a surprise. But the, I think the issue for Trump is that he's going to go and trash the, the UAW leadership, which he's already been doing while trying to um, keep common cause with the workers. So the, the risk for Trump is, as with many things, is it going to come off as it's just another one of his grievances? He's only he's only there to complain about the UAW leadership, or is he going to seem sincere in his support for the auto workers? We will certainly be watching uh, this afternoon, and then of course tonight, what we're hearing from President Trump during the second uh, presidential primary debate for the GOP. All right, Rick, thanks so much. Yep. Stick around, because coming up next, stay tuned. Just a few moments, we will be speaking with former Vice President and Republican presidential candidate Mike Pence. That's coming up next, right here on Yahoo Finance. We'll be right back.
Welcome back, everyone. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith at the NASDAQ in New York City. We're about 30 minutes into the trading day, just shy of it here. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. Stocks are lower today as markets stay on course for a losing month. Recession worries remain a concern for investors. And JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon warning the U.S. economy may not be prepared for the fallout should the Fed raise rates to 7%. We're also watching shares of Tesla today. The EV maker will reportedly face scrutiny amid an EU investigation into foreign automakers that export from China on claims of unfair subsidies. This is according to a report from the Financial Times. And we are watching oil prices today after the dollar hit an eight month high, raising concerns on demand. Despite the pullback, oil is still on track for its largest quarterly gain since March of 2022. And AMC shares on the move this morning after announcing Taylor Swift's Eras concert film is going global. Now, Swifties in over 100 countries worldwide are going to be able to enjoy the film as soon as October 13th. And tickets for most international locations will go on sale today. Now let's get to the market commentary of the day, and it's out from Citigroup's Chris Montague. Now he wrote in a note this morning that, quote, despite the extended sell-off, net positioning in all markets is not overly extended. Neither are profits, losses very large here. Now he went on to say that this leaves positioning relatively light and generally reflecting the parent bearish sentiment globally. And Brad, when we take into account what we've heard from the street, what we've heard from Fed officials, just about the uncertainty that lies ahead, what exactly Fed policy is going to look like if the Fed is, in fact, going to raise rates one more time. We have seen the bears grow a little bit louder, just yeah. about what that means in terms of the probability of a recession, the chances of a recession. Obviously, then if we do see that, we would see a reaction in equities. But despite all that, the market has remained re amazingly resilient up yeah. until this point. The consumer has remained resilient, and that has really helped us really not fall too far back yeah. from those highs that we made earlier this year. Yeah, we certainly saw this showing up in the tape at the tail end of last week, especially after the Fed came out with their decision for September, which was largely viewed going into it as maybe not necessarily a nothing burger, but perhaps a focus more on the dot plot type of event, as we were discussing with economists over the course of last week. And so how investors are positioning their portfolio? Well, as of right now, it seems like even though we are seeing kind of more of a broad-based pullback because of the shock that the Fed did in put into the broader system as of right now um, and into the equity markets, the larger question going forward is, will we see a repeat of some of the most Fed sensitive areas of the equity market that will be impacted and investors perhaps taking chips off the table in the near term period of time until they get a little bit more certainty around that. But I would be watching and uh, many perhaps keeping an eye on technology and as well keeping an eye on uh, keeping an eye on consumer discretionary as well. And so we'll be watching that extremely closely going forward. We certainly will. All right, well, the second Republican debate is set for tomorrow, where GOP candidates will go head to head on a wide range of issues from inflation to immigration to foreign policy. Now, the state of the economy is going to be a big focus. A new Washington Post and ABC News poll found that 74 percent of Americans disapprove of the current state of the economy, and inflation is a big reason for that. Former Vice President of the United States Mike Pence joins us now, along with Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. Mr. Vice President, thanks so much for your time. It's good to see you. You bet. Good to be with you all. Thank you. Mr. Vice President, uh, President Biden reappointed Jay Powell as Fed chair for a second term. And here we are today. Inflation is still too high. The Fed signaling higher for longer rates. We know Americans are starting to get increasingly worried just about what the inflation picture is going to look like over the next several months, several years. If you were elected president, would you look to remove Chair Powell before his term expires in 2028? Well, I, look, I'd, uh, I would absolutely go in a different direction with the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Um, I mean, the, the fact is that, uh, that the, the policies of quantitative easing back in the day and the policies that the, the Fed chairman has implemented have uh, all been playing catch up. And we, we need a fresh leadership at the Fed that's going to that's going to step forward and, and join us in an effort to really tackle the inflation that is waging war on American families. I mean, that, that number you cited in the poll today, Shauna, is just, I, I think it might be a little low. Everywhere I go across this country, I, I hear families that are struggling. Two out of three families living paycheck to paycheck. 
Uh, we've gone to about 17% inflation since we left office. And it's all a result uh, of uh, Joe Biden's runaway spending, his war on energy. Uh, and I expect when we take to the stage at the Reagan Library tomorrow night, uh, there's going to be uh, there's going to be a renewed focus on uh, on the plan each and every one of us has. But but not only having new leadership at the Fed, but also I, I think the time has come for us to end the dual mandate at the Federal Reserve. You know, I, I for years now, as you all well know, we've we've said the Federal Reserve needs to work on protecting the dollar and uh, full employment. Well, I think full employment ought to be the job. Uh, of the president, of members of Congress, of governors and elected officials. Uh, we ought to focus Federal Reserve on protecting the integrity of the dollar. I'll do that if I'm president of the United States. So ending the dual mandate, uh, bringing new leadership to the Fed, that'll, that'll all be part of the Pence plan if I become president of the United States. And so you believe the Fed dual mandate, price stabilization, maximum employment should be trimmed under the existing Fed mandate. What, what grade then would you give Chair Powell and the FOMC in the effort to stabilize inflation now? Well, you know, it's, it's almost like they're, they're chasing after the failed policies of, of Bidenomics. I mean, Joe Biden is traveling around the country talking about Bidenomics being a success. And so uh, I, I understand why after, after years of, of quantitative easing and essentially free money, uh, why the Federal Reserve has taken the steps that they're taking, but they're painful and they're, they're really the, the, the result of, of failed policies of, of this administration. So I, I want to focus, I want to focus uh, on, on uh, where the real responsibility is, and that is that we, we need new leadership in the White House. And, and frankly, I also believe we need new leadership in the Republican Party because at a time of, uh, of record inflation over the last two and a half years, at a time of, uh, of, of, of rising energy prices, at, at, let alone other crises at the border and, and otherwise, uh, I, I really do see the Republican Party and frankly my former running mate really walking away from a commitment to fiscal responsibility, to reform, to the kind of steps that'll, that'll put our nation back on a path of fiscal solvency uh, and uh, lay a foundation for real economic growth. So uh, let me ask you about fiscal responsibility. Um, there are a couple of uh, factors there. One is tax cuts, which reduce federal revenue. Republicans did that in the Trump tax cut law that went into effect in 2018. And then they're spending. This is going to come back again because some of those Trump tax cuts are supposed to expire at the end of 2025. I believe you want to extend those tax cuts. Those are mostly tax cuts for individuals. But then you give up federal revenue, so you make the federal revenue problem worse. How do you address that problem? Well, we worked hard to pass the largest tax cuts and tax reform in American history back in uh, 2017, and the economy boomed. And frankly, uh, check the record, federal revenues went up, as they almost invariably do, more than a 40% increase in federal revenues in some categories. So you know, I'm confident that step one to getting this economy back on track is to make, make the Trump-Pence tax cuts permanent, which, as you point out, do go away at the end of 2025. The other is I, I think we need to take a hard run at getting to a 15 percent corporate tax rate in this country. You know, we tried to do that in the beginning. Ultimately, we settled out north of 20 percent. But but I, I really do believe to put it to put American businesses at at, at a d advantage for attracting capital and investment and creating jobs here in our country, we ought to drive down uh, that corporate tax rate. But lastly, the last thing we should ever do is raise taxes. And people deserve to know that Donald Trump is actually talking about a 10 percent tariff on all imports into the United States of America. I think it would be the worst possible time to impose what could be one of the largest tax increases in history, raising the cost of goods uh, at, at the retail level for Americans, raising the cost of input in manufacturing. I mean, now more than ever, we need, we need to lower taxes, we need to balance budgets, and, and ultimately, uh, we need to put our nation on a path of fiscal solvency by having leadership that's willing to engage the American people on reforming the real drivers of federal spending, uh, which are entitlements and mandatory spending at the federal level. We have an intensifying auto workers strike. President Biden uh, is on way to uh, walk with uh, striking workers today. President Trump is going to address them tomorrow. Um, how would you resolve this uh, this strike? Would you first of all would you get involved? 
Uh, second of all, do you think the auto workers deserve the additional pay and job security and benefits that they are asking for? Well, first, first, let me say, you know, I, I was governor of Indiana, and Indiana is the second leading manufacturing state in the country uh, per capita. We got an awful lot of auto workers in the state, and they're just great men and women, part of a great tradition. But I got to tell you, I think what's driving that UAW strike is not the standard arguments over class warfare and disparity between income and wages. I think it's that the fact is, under Bidenomics, wages are not keeping up with inflation. Uh, and, and American auto workers know that, they're feeling it. And secondly, and just as important, uh, the Green New Deal buried in that so-called Inflation Reduction Act is waging war on, on, uh, on, on people that manufacture combustion engine automobiles, which last time I checked is most of what they manufacture in Detroit. I mean, I, I think any auto worker paying attention, and they all do, has got to understand uh, that Bidenomics has failed to protect their paychecks, and also that this drive toward mandating and subsidizing electric vehicles, the batteries for which are mostly made in China, many of those cars will be manufactured in China, and, the, and those factories are being built outside of Michigan. Those auto workers, I think, are stepping up. And when Joe Biden makes it to that uh, picket line, uh, I, I would encourage any UAW workers looking on to pull them aside and say, Hey, can, can, we, uh, can we undo this Green New Deal that's, that's uh, poised to shut down gasoline-powered vehicles all over this country uh, in the next 10 to 15 years? And, uh, but at the end of the day, too, I, I, I would tell you, you know, I'm someone that believes in right to work. Uh, I believe people ought to be able to choose whether they join a union or don't join a union. Uh, Michigan just went backwards uh, on right to work. They repealed the right to work legislation that they passed. And... Uh, you know, I, I really do believe that the pathway forward for prosperity in manufacturing, including the automotive industry, uh, is to create a more competitive environment, have right to work, let's get beyond this Green New Deal electric vehicle mandate and subsidies, uh, and let's, let's, uh, let's bring policies that will really get wages rising in the country. So, Vice President, I just want to make sure I'm hearing you correctly. So you think that the strike right now by the UAW workers, that it is justified? Well, I, look, I, th I think the, that 74 percent of Americans that are frustrated with the economy under Joe Biden, I think that sentiment is very justified. <laughs> but wages have not been keeping up with inflation, despite all the happy talk coming out of Washington, D.C., and working Americans know it. Now, I, you know, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave to the, the workers and negotiators and to the company to sort out, you know, what, uh, what changes could be made. I know there's negotiations underway. I'm a free market conservative. I believe those things ought to be settled uh, in the free market. If I was president, I'd certainly encourage uh, the dialogue. Uh, but uh, but I'd, also, I'd also go to the root causes of this, which is the fact that, that runaway inflation is undermining wages in this country, and this electric vehicle mandate and these subsidies are undermining uh, combustion engine manufacturing of automobiles in this country, and auto workers know it. Let's talk about some of the business, biggest business profiles in the free market. During your 2020 re-election campaign, UAW, they endorsed Biden. Current Disney CEO Bob Iger endorsed Biden. Even former HP Enterprise CEO and former California gubernatorial candidate Megan, uh, candidate Meg Whitman endorsed Biden, a Republican, I might add. Why should U.S. business executives believe that the Republican Party is now unified towards U.S. economic interests versus pandering to expressed ideals of far-right supporters? Well, I, I think that's, uh, that's what we're settling out uh, in this primary. You know, I, I, I'm actually very excited to, to be at the Reagan Library. It's a place my family has visited uh, a number of times. I actually became a Republican because of Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan combined uh, optimism, uh, civility, with a vision for getting this economy moving again. You think of the parallels between today and the 1970s, they're striking. I mean, inflation uh, out of control, gasoline prices rising, embarrassment on the world stage, a failed Democrat administration. And Ronald Reagan stepped forward, not on the force of personality, not, not by bringing grievances forward, but because he articulated a vision of limited government, free market economics, a commitment to timeless American values, and America came roaring back. I think as people look at their, our various campaigns and candidates, uh, I expect they're going to be looking for the same vision. And uh, 
uh, as I'll try and do on this Wednesday night. I, I hope when people uh, see me, see I'm, I'm a conservative that, that has all of my life and career been advancing that same commitment to a strong America at home and abroad, to limited government, free market economics and values. It's what brought us back after the 70s. Uh, it's what began to bring us back during our administration before that pandemic struck. But it's the real pathway toward a boundless American future, I'm confident. Some of your proposals would require congressional action, such as changing the Fed's mandate. Congress would have to do that. That's hard to do. Uh, but if you, be, if you were to become president, what's the first Biden economic policy you would change through regulatory or executive action? Well, I, I think first and foremost is you step up and you undo what he undid uh, at the southern border of the United States. Look, a, a, a nation without borders is not a nation. And Joe Biden, on the first day of his administration, signed a stack of executive orders, uh, the, the ending construction of the wall. He began a steady assault on the remain in Mexico policy that I negotiated uh, with Mexican officials. Uh, the, the combinations of what we did ended illegal immigration and asylum abuse essentially by 90 percent before that pandemic struck. Uh, and so I, I think securing the southern border of the United States, ending this avalanche of more than five million people uh, into our country uh, is really job one. But but secondly, I think you've got to turn off the gusher of spending. I've, I've got a plan at MikePence2024.com that, that really lays out about $1.2 trillion in cuts, uh, uh, the unspent dollars of about $3 trillion we need to cut off. I mean, I think the American people actually know that all of this debt that's piling up in Washington, D.C., is driving the inflation that is literally robbing the value of what's uh, in their uh, in their wallets and in their pocketbooks. And and uh, and so turning off the gusher of spending and then taking my experiences, 12 years in the Congress, four years as vice president and four years as a governor to bear on bringing people together and figuring out a way that we can advance policies that will get this economy moving again. But I think the great challenge for our generation is going to be coming to terms with a national debt the size of our nation's economy. Uh, I'm one of the first candidates to actually even be willing to talk about reforming mandatory spending and entitlements for younger Americans. Uh, I'll sit members of Congress down on day one, give them a vision for restoring fiscal solvency. Joe Biden's policy is insolvency. He won't even talk about uh, these large programs that are more than 70 percent of the federal budget. Donald Trump's policy is identical to Joe Biden's. Most of the candidates in the Republican primary are the same. But for me, it's about going to the American people, going to Congress and putting America back on a solid foundation and a path to a balanced federal budget. Would you resume construction of the Trump wall on the southern border? Day one, you uh, resume construction. And frankly, I've been down to the border four times. and. Uh, for <laughs> You know, the girders that are still rusting in the sun, laying on their side, that have been there since Joe Biden stopped construction of the wall are going to be pretty handy uh, for, for construction workers to continue it. Look, the cartels are in operational control of the border. That's not my language. That's what our Border Patrol agents have told me. The wall is part of that. Remain in Mexico is part of that. Title 42 uh, is part of that, uh, but also just uh, recognizing that at the end of the day, we have a broken immigration system and, and, and we're going to have to go to the American people ultimately once we secure our border and fix this system once and for all. Uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, you do support uh, U.S. military aid to Ukraine, uh, unlike some members of the Republican Party. Um, would you do more? Would you, uh, if you were president, would you be giving uh, Ukraine more advanced weapons, uh, perhaps putting U.S. military advisors in Ukraine doing things like that? Well, well Russia's unconscionable and brutal invasion uh, of Ukraine uh, is, was an act of evil. Uh, I've actually traveled into the region, um, seen the aftermath of, uh, of the human tragedy that continues to unfold there. And I hold to the, what used to be called the Reagan Doctrine, which is if you're willing to fight our enemies on your soil, we'll give you the means to fight them there so we don't have to fight them. I think Joe Biden's done a terrible job explaining our national interest in Ukraine and in supporting their military. Look, I, I've got a son in the Marine Corps, a son-in-law in the Navy. I have no doubt uh, that Vladimir Putin, if he overruns Ukraine, he's going to cross the border of a NATO country that we're going to have to send our soldiers to fight. So I want to give Ukraine what they need to fight them 
there, and I want to do a better job than Joe Biden has done. It seems to me Joe Biden has just given Ukraine enough not to lose. Uh, but I, I think providing them with the, uh, you know, the advanced weaponry, with missiles, with the aircraft necessary to really take the fight to the Russians and drive them out, it's the, it's the fastest way to ending this conflict. Appeasement has never worked. Uh, I know that, uh, that Donald Trump and uh, others in this Republican field are talking about ending the race. Others are questioning that we have any national interest there at all. Uh, look, it, uh, Ukraine is not our war, but freedom is our fight. And I think it's, it, is, it is imperative the United States of America continue to provide the soldiers in Ukraine what they need to repel that Russian invasion. I also think that sends the best message possible that we can send to China, uh, that America is the leader of the free world and, and the Western world will not tolerate uh, them using force to extend their ambitions, especially when it comes to Taiwan. You've talked about this split in the Republican Party between populists and uh, traditional Reaganite conservatives uh, uh, such as yourself. Um, what can anybody do about what's going on in the Republican Party with threatening to default on the U.S. debt? We now have threats of a shutdown. We have some Republicans saying, let's stop uh, supporting Ukraine, no, no blank check. I mean, what, what, how do you either bring this uh, party together or change it into something that looks like it is able to function and govern efficiently? Well, first, let me say about the government shutdown. You know, I was, I was a House conservative leader for 12 years, and uh, House Republicans are the last line of defense for taxpayers in Washington, D.C. So I, I encourage the team there and Speaker McCarthy to continue to drive and drive hard for one more down payment on fiscal responsibility and, and putting our nation back on a path toward a balanced budget. But, uh, but really, at, at the end of the day, um, the, I, I think this ultimately goes into the hands of the American people. I'm, I'm working my heart out uh, to make it clear that uh, I believe the choice in this election uh, for Republican primary voters is whether or not we're going to stay on the path of time-honored conservative principles of American leadership, uh, in the world of uh, limited government, fiscal responsibility, free market economics and values, or whether, whether we're going to follow the siren song of populism off uh, uh, unmoored to conservative principles, and, uh, and whether that be on our place in the world, whether it be on economic policies, whether it be on values. I, I believe the majority of Republican voters, the majority of independents and many Democrats, uh, Look at that, uh, that uh, common sense conservative agenda that's defined our party over the last 50 years. And they know that's the pathway forward for America. And I'm, I'm confident that they'll choose that agenda one more time. And I'm going to work my heart out to earn the right to carry that agenda, not just to victory in 24, uh, but, uh, but ultimately to a victory, prosperity, and security for the American people in the years ahead. Mr. Vice President, a sticking point for Americans has been high gas prices. We know President Biden has been calling on oil companies to boost production. But when you take into or when you take a look at the amount of production that we have seen, we're actually on track to pump more oil than ever this year. So what would you do that the Biden administration is not doing in order to get a better handle on energy prices? Well, I, I would uh, I'd end the war on energy, Sean, first and foremost. I, uh, day one, Joe Biden shut down the Keystone and Dakota pipelines. He's offline millions of acres, most recently more acreage uh, in Alaska. They've slow walked uh, leases. In spite of that, the American energy industry has been fighting through that. Uh, we, we need to build out refinery capacity in this country. We need to, we need to uh, continue to extend that natural gas revolution that began under our, our administration. We need an all of the above energy strategy and we need to end uh, the headlong rush of, uh, of Joe Biden and the Democrats uh, to advance this Green New Deal, to use mandates and, and subsidies to drive Americans toward uh, alternative sources of energy. I mean, look, we, we, uh, we actually, during our administration, we, we got out of the Paris Climate Accord. It was a terrible deal for America and requested almost nothing of places like China and India, uh, at least in the next decade or so. Um, but what a lot of people don't know is we actually reduced CO2 emissions in our administration beyond the goals in the Paris Climate Accord, but we did it through American innovation. We did it by developing the resources of our country. We became a net exporter of energy for the first time in 75 years. We can, we can get back to that 
I've got a plan, again, at my website, MikePence2024.com, not only to achieve American energy independence, but to reclaim our role in the next 10 years as the leading producer of energy in the world. We lost it back in 2006. Uh, China holds that title today. Uh, we can reclaim that title with the right policies and ending the war on energy in Washington. So you're kind of trashing green energy. Uh, so I, one question is, is, what is so bad about green energy? But, that, but also, you've got literally hundreds of billions of dollars in tax incentives that are now in the economy. Companies are responding to those tax incentives. They're making commitments uh, to build factories, uh, and they are investing money. And one of the complaints you hear in the energy industry itself is, you know, Washington just yo-yos from one set of policy things to another, and this makes us reluctant to invest. So do you actually want to cancel all of those, uh, those green energy incentives uh, and then have those companies say, well, we, you know, never mind, we started building a factory, but we're just going to mothball it? Or would you leave some of them in place? Or what, what exactly would you do with all of that? I, I want uh, energy policy in America that uh, is source neutral. Uh, and and the, the Pence Energy Plan that we outlined about a month ago has that same objective. Look, the, ever since the Obama-Biden administration, they've been trying to put their thumb on the scale to drive us toward uh, renewable energy. They've been trying through their cap-and-trade scheme to increase the cost of energy. Joe Biden himself and his campaign said that we will end fossil fuels uh, in America. That is, that is uh, not, not only... Uh, 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 not only against the interests of the American people, it's categorically unrealistic by any measure when you think about global energy consumption over the next 25 years. I mean, we've got to have an all of the above energy strategy. We've got to have a source neutral energy strategy. We've got to take our thumb off the scale. But you check my record. I, I'm, I'm an all of the above energy guy. In the state of Indiana, when I was governor, we, 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 we had a strong commitment to renewables. I want to see the marketplace develop those things, not driving through mandates like you're seeing in places like California or government subsidies that, uh, again, I, I would tell all of you, I, I, think, I think the heavy handed approach of the Green New Deal has created the conditions that have got auto workers on that picket line in large measure in Detroit and around the country. All right, former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence, thanks for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. See you tomorrow. <laughs> See ya. Well, we just spoke with former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence. He said that the Fed is, uh, he said the Fed's steps were painful and result of failed policies that we need to drive down the corporate tax rate and that the last thing we should do is raise taxes. For more on this, we're joined by Kai Komanduri, who is the uh, political strategist, and Lani Chen, who is the fellow in American Public Policy Studies at the Hoover Institution. Uh, thank you both for joining us here this morning. Uh, Lani, I would love to start with you, just get your broader take on what you heard and whether or not we should actually expect for any type of congressional action that would change over the Federal Reserve uh, and reform the dual mandate. I think it's unlikely. Uh, you know, obviously, Congress has a difficult time even walking in a straight line right now, uh, given the, the challenges around keeping the government open, uh, around some of the more basic issues that we face. We're going to have a bunch of end of year uh, issues. And then looking beyond that, once you get into an election year, 2024, the likelihood that Congress uh, even does anything is uh, is remote to none, just given the, the political dynamics of next year. So. Um, I, I'm skeptical. Perhaps in the longer run, there will be efforts to conduct uh, appropriate oversight. There will be efforts to examine whether the dual mandate is something that needs to be uh, terminated. But I don't see any imminent congressional action or even any congressional action in the in the midterm, uh, just given the challenges that Congress faces and all of the different things that has to get done and the political polarization that we see around not just this issue, but a whole set of other issues as well. Chai, I heard uh, Mike Pence trying to differentiate himself from his former boss, President Trump, there. I don't think we even asked a question about Donald Trump, but uh, he brought it up himself several times. Uh, one example he gave was uh, Trump's plan for a 10 percent tax on all imports. He said that's a terrible idea. Uh, do you think um, Mike Pence has sufficiently differentiated himself from Donald Trump? I think he has, but I think the unfortunate thing for Mike Pence is he is jettisoning the most popular elements 
of Donald Trump's agenda, his economic populism, and elevating the least popular elements of Donald Trump's agenda, the tax cuts for corporations and for the rich. Um, you know, Paul Krugman probably summed up Mike Pence's philosophy, I think, best by describing it as zombie Reaganism. And I think Mike Pence at this point is sort of a zombie candidate waging a zombie campaign. Uh, there is virtually no path forward for him. And it's really odd to me that he has chosen to fight Donald Trump uh, on, on the things that people like the most about him among the Republican base and not necessarily the things that people like the least about him. Lonnie, when it comes to what needs to happen with oil, with energy to get gas prices under control, we asked uh, former uh, Vice President Mike Pence about this. He was talking about that we need to stop this war on energy. I'm curious to get your perspective on this, because like we said, when we threw in that question, production, U.S. oil production right now is on track to hit all time records this year. Well, I think there's a few elements. There certainly have been some regulatory changes made by the Biden administration uh, that I think in the intermediate to long term will reduce the amount of energy extraction we see in the United States. For example, some of the restrictions around exploration uh, in the Arctic. Uh, there's also this issue of working with our North American partners. One of the things that uh, the former vice president, uh, when he was in the Trump administration, one of the things that, that that was stressed by that administration was the value of working together with Canada and Mexico uh, on the extraction of energy in North America to ensure a more steady and stable supply. That is an example, again, of where I think we have seen uh, some of the productivity falter over the last couple of years. So I think the vice president, former vice president, uh, makes a good point about some of the areas in which we could potentially be doing more. I think there's no question uh, that production has increased in part in reaction to uh, just some of what we're seeing around the demand for energy continuing to be quite high. But nonetheless, gas prices are creeping back up. This continues to be a cost of living issue. And so it's a political consideration and concern for the Biden administration, I think, going into this election cycle, how people feel about the state of the economy, how they feel about energy prices. Uh, that more than anything, I think, is driving some of this conversation we're seeing now. Chai, we talked about the uh, auto worker strike with uh, Vice President, former Vice President Pence. So President Biden there today walking a picket line, Trump going there tomorrow. Do you see the, uh, the way this strike plays out breaking either for or against either one of those two guys, uh, Trump and Biden? Uh, yeah, I do. I think if the strike goes on for a protracted period of time, uh, unfortunately, I say this is a Democrat, Donald, uh, Joe Biden will be blamed uh, just simply because the bad economic conditions it creates, the chaos it creates. Uh, as the president of the United States, he will be blamed for that. So I do think if this strike goes on for a protracted period of time, it will it will hurt Joe Biden. Absolutely. Whether it helps Donald Trump or hurts him, I, I you know I don't think that it's it's really much of a factor. Jay, is it clear whether or not the Republican Party right now, or even? Vice President Mike Pence, former Vice President Mike Pence, has a plan for or a top idea for how they would negotiate with China? No, I think what you're hearing is a lot of belligerence. And I think that they're stoking what I feel is sort of a xenophobic sentiment in the Republican base with a lot of the anti Chinese rhetoric that you're hearing. You know, Joe Biden has maintained a very tough line with China on tariffs. He's largely kept a lot of the Trump policies uh, on trade with China in place. Um, he has been a tough negotiator with them. It is unclear to me, other than more belligerent rhetoric, what the Republicans would offer. I ask each of you guys real quickly, um, what is your top thing to watch for in the debate tomorrow night? It is about uh, the economy. So what, what are you all looking for? Chow, you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, there's a recent poll that shows Nikki Haley is now second in New Hampshire. She is a distant second. But if she has another terrific performance in the debate, I expect her numbers to continue to go up. That would be the, what I would be watching the most, her performance. Right now, it feels to me like she's really the only candidate who has a credible chance of pulling an upset. Lonnie, what's your number one thing to watch for in the debate? Well, I continue to see and look for how sharply the candidates are going to draw distinctions with Donald Trump. I think in the first debate, uh, you saw some of that. Uh, but is that sharpening of distinction, particularly, as you note, on issues around the economy, around the performance of the economy, around some of the things Trump has said about his plans for a second term, 
uh, to what degree are candidates really going to aggressively go after the former president, recognizing that time is running short. And if they don't do so, uh, they really risk falling even farther behind, which is really saying something given the state of the polls right now. Well, Ani, when you talk about the state of the GOP, the Republican Party right now, obviously a lot of infighting. You have the showdown that's going on down in D.C. Who is the best candidate from your perspective to unite the party and really get the GOP party back on track? Well, I, you know, I, there's any number of these candidates who I would uh, believe would be in a good position. Uh, Nikki Haley has obviously demonstrated her strength in the polling. Uh, I certainly think Tim Scott uh, has the capacity and the potential to do so. Ron DeSantis was seen as a great hope at one point. Uh, I think he has some of the base as well as some of the, the governing record to potentially be successful. So I think any number of those candidates could do it. I think Haley's in the best position right now. There's no question she's in the catbird seat. If you look at polling matchups with the the uh, current president she is uh, a, a, in a great position to defeat him next november so i do think nikki haley probably as we look at it today is best positioned but this is a very fluid race certainly in that in that second tranche of candidates so we could see a lot of change based on what happens tomorrow night lonnie chen and che commandori thanks so much for giving us your perspectives appreciate it thank you Keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. We'll be right back. We're at the NASDAQ in New York City. Let's do a quick check of the markets about an hour into the trading day. And this market check sponsored by Tasty Trade. We're still looking at losses across the board. You have the Dow now off nearly 300 points. The S&P off about 1% as well as the NASDAQ. And taking a look at the sector action, we are seeing a lot of red here almost across the board. Consumer discretionary technology, communication services among the biggest decliners in today's trading action. All 11 of the S&P sectors trading to the downside. Well, Amazon is finally making a big bet in the generative AI game with a $4 billion investment in open AI competitor Anthropic. Here with the latest is Yahoo Finance senior tech reporter Dan Halley. Dan. That's right, Shona. Amazon announcing this uh, investment in Anthropic yesterday. Uh, a big part of this is Amazon's ability to stay relevant and at top of mind when it comes to generative AI, AI in general, uh, and large language models. And that's really why they're making this huge investment into Anthropic. Anthropic is one of the, the major players in this space. Uh, we talk about open AI constantly because of the popularity of uh, GPT and chat GPT, as well as Microsoft's uh, 
$10 billion investment in them. Uh, but Anthropic is just, a much, uh, just as much of a player. Uh, and the reason why Amazon is doing this is to ensure uh, investors as well as users that it is more than capable of tackling competitors like Microsoft and like Google when it comes to the uh, availability of these kinds of capabilities. And so they're making this investment. They already have uh, native large language models uh, available through AWS. Uh, and so they're going to obviously work this into AWS as well. Uh, and that's really their way of saying, we're, we're here, uh, Microsoft isn't the only one doing this, Google isn't the only one doing this. Uh, and we're also going to be offering a huge variety uh, of different offerings as far as these large language models uh, and generative AI capabilities go. So it's it's more or less Amazon's way of, of planting its flag uh, and saying, we're going to be uh, right up there with these other two. Uh, we are the largest cloud provider uh, in the world uh, as far as uh, public cloud. And so uh, we're going to ensure that we offer the kinds of software and, and services that you would expect. So that's really the, the thrust of this investment uh, from Amazon. And, uh, from some of the analysts that I spoke with, this is going to be uh, a very big deal for them when it comes to being able to stick out and be one of the, the continue to be one of the big three uh, as far as not just cloud, but AI as well. All right, an AI planted flag with a happy face on it. Dan Howley, thanks so much, appreciate it. All your markets action straight ahead, stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. We're live from the NASDAQ market site. There's always hope, and uh, I don't believe believe in a no-win scenario. Like, we understand what, what a shutdown means uh, to the government, to the American people. Uh, I certainly do not want that. Uh, and so we also have some other Republicans on the more moderate side that uh, certainly don't want that. It's an interesting situation. I hope that uh, during this weekend, we can come to some solution and come back and work it through. The odds of a shutdown are increasing. Modern, mature governments should not be shutting down. Uh, it's uh, certainly a crazy impact, probably an impact on the markets, an impact on the economy, an impact on all of the government operations essential to keep the society humming along. And right now, the House is talking about going out for five days and coming back next Tuesday. And at that point, they would just have till midnight Saturday to work out a continuing resolution. So uh, things are looking worse than they did a couple days ago. The real problem right now is Speaker McCarthy uh, continues to be really um, led around uh, by a very far right uh, extreme contingent in his caucus. Um, look, at the end of the day, uh, if Speaker McCarthy agrees to put up for a vote in the House, the kind of bipartisan proposals that we're sending from the Senate, I'm confident that they would pass. Uh, the question is whether um, he will put the country before his own interests uh, and, and move forward in that way. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance, live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. A possible U.S. government shutdown looms, and with it, risks to the U.S. credit rating. Moody's apparently looking at a downgrade if the government does go into shutdown. Our next guest says that that move very much depends on whether there is a shutdown and how long it lasts. If so, joining us now, uh, we've got us uh, a good one. John Heltman, American Bankers Washington Bureau Chief. Always a good one, John, of course. Thanks, um, you're a good one think too. About <laughs> yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. When you think about the the extent to which or the time span to which a shutdown would have to last for it to have a larger impact on the credit rating, as as we had been hearing from Moody's, what type of evaluation would you give that? Or what type of time span will we need to be looking at as well? I mean, that's a great question. Uh, the fact that Moody's is out there already just kind of warning that this is a problem indicates that it wouldn't necessarily have to be a record-breaking shutdown for it to have a negative impact on the U.S. credit rating. Now, this is not a brand new concept, right? I mean, just a few months ago, we had the, uh, the debt ceiling fight that was a much bigger and much more kind of existential threat to the U.S. credit availability or credit uh, rating. Um, but I think there's this is part of a broader problem, which is that Congress doesn't really hasn't passed a budget in regular order for years and years and years. And these this just kind of is a perennial problem that keeps happening, keeps coming up, keeps coming back. So 
one of these days we're going to have to get this right. And if we ever want to have not have this problem looming over our shoulders all the time. John, how closely should investors really be tracking this? Because like you said, largely in the past, when it comes to government shutdowns, we haven't really seen a massive ripple effect in the market that tends to stick. Looking back to 2019, we actually saw the S&P rise over 10 percent during the shutdown. So do you think investors are going to be able to look past it this time around again? I think that markets have generally uh, sort of come to the assumption that there's going to be a shutdown or at least are pricing it in uh, as of right now. So I think the market effects really depend on how long the shutdown lasts. If it lasts, as you say, for like a week or two, I think there's a, a sort of stopgap uh, short term spending bill that's being discussed in the Senate. Uh, that'll certainly buy some time to come up with a more fulsome approach. And if all those things happen, then the effects, I think, on the, on the market are going to be relatively limited. Um, but the real risk is, and the real question is if this goes on for, you know, again, weeks, months, you know, like then, then you really see the wheels come off the bus. Another developing story, bank capital rules and J.P. Morgan's CEO, Jamie Dimon, criticizing the stricter proposals from U.S. regulators, calling the move, quote, hugely disappointing and a risk for U.S. growth. Now, he's not alone. U.S. bank groups also have accused regulators of violating federal laws with their sweeping proposals. We still have John Heltzman, American Bankers Washington Bureau Chief, with us. So, John, when we try to figure out what the implications are for the banking sector, what exactly this could look like, What's on your radar? Yeah, I mean, the, the capital proposals primarily focus on the largest banks. And that by largest, I mean banks with 100 billion of assets or more. That seems like an awful lot of money. Uh, but keep in mind that there's 4,500 depository, or sorry, 4,500 banks, another 4,500 credit unions in the country. The vast majority of those are way below that threshold. So we're really talking about, you know, 20, 25 banks uh, and credit unions or really banks, because this is not a credit union thing yet, uh, that for whom this would apply. But those are the banks that have the vast majority of deposit shares, so it, it's very important. And what this would do is it would basically require them to withhold, uh, to hold a great deal more capital than they have been uh, up till now. Uh, that just makes the cost of everything more expensive. It makes uh, it makes them uh, makes it harder to make loans. Uh, makes it more expensive to make loans. Therefore, making them making banks not do it as much. So that's the risk, and and uh, I think that it's decently well founded because we already have some economic headwinds with high interest rates, making loan demand, uh, tamping down loan demand, and making it harder for banks to make loans. And so, would that lead to further consolidation among banks who can't meet that threshold? Probably. Um, <laughs> you know, the uh, if you if you have a higher costs to do the same kind of business that you were already doing. Uh, eventually, banks are going to look around and say, you know what, we could do this better if we merge with these guys or we acquire this or that bank. And especially smaller banks will see that they are having to compete with bigger, well-heeled, better-heeled uh, competitors. So there are, there's going to be a lot more pressure to merge. Now, at the same time that all of this is happening, the uh, the government, the regulators are considering uh, overhauling the bank merger review process with Kind of seemingly an eye towards discouraging mergers that that is not yet kind of firmly proposed so we don't quite know what the contours of that are going to be but with all these things kind of happening at the same time uh something's going to have to give all right john Heltman, american bankers washington bureau chief thanks so much for joining us here Thank this you. morning well, a government shutdown would have dramatic implications for the U.S. travel economy, with some estimates putting the hit at around $140 million a day. The aviation sector is a key focus. While many essential staff, like air traffic controllers, are expected to report for duty without pay, workers calling in sick could be an issue yet again. We want to bring in Mike Boyd, Boyd Group International President. And Mike, lay this out for us, because the estimates are all over the place at exactly what a government shutdown, the impact that that is going to have on the travel industry. What's your view? Well, I think initially air travel will be just as inconvenient as ever. Uh, we have understaffed air traffic control systems right now, and the employees know they're going to get paid eventually. The real issue is long term, and it's not just things like training. Buttigieg brought that up. That really won't come into play. What really will come into play is the day-to-day -day regulation that the FAA has over airports, 
airlines, and also aircraft manufacturers, where Boeing won't be able to get that inspector to take a look at that that new system they want approved. An uh, airport in eastern Wyoming won't be able to get an FAA inspector to come and look at the new runway. Over a period of time, that could have a hit. Would this also impact some infrastructure projects, especially given the environmental reviews, permitting that would be disrupted, and, and some of these infrastructural projects taking place in or around or at airports? It, it, it would. In the near term, it certainly wouldn't have much of an effect. It's only going to be several days, probably. But nevertheless, uh, in, in terms of hurting the environment, that's not going to be the case, I don't think, per se. It'll just you know, If you shut down the whole air transportation system, that's a lot less jet fuel going into the air. But nevertheless, the bottom line of the whole thing is the FAA is in a situation right now where it needs to get reorganized and revisited. We've got new electric airplanes coming along line that are really heading for a brick wall regula regulation-wise. We really can't take these people off of those jobs because that's critically important. You and I don't see that, but in five years, five years, in five weeks, five months, we probably will. Mike, what about the traveler's behavior? Do we typically see people maybe canceling their trips if we see a government shutdown? I think people that don't really look into it probably would assume, yes, if the government shuts down, my airplane might shut down. Let's not go see grandma right now. Um, that There'll be some of that. But I think overall, the at least if this doesn't last you know, more than a couple of weeks, more than a week or so, we're not going to see a whole lot of anything. I don't see a walkout. I don't see people calling in sick. These controllers and TSA people, they know they're going to get paid. It's just going to be a little late paycheck, and there might be something after it when it comes. Certainly, and, and that was the case back in 2019 where we did see absenteeism on the rise, especially after that two-week period because of delayed paychecks. Now, what kind of impact would that mean for the airline operators should we get to that point? Well, right now today, our air traffic control system has been a wonderfully bipartisan, you know, mismanaged thing over the last 20 years. So I don't think we're going to see anything missing right now. But overall, you know, it's just going to accelerate a decline in the efficiency of our air transportation system, mainly because of you know the ATC system, but also issues of oversight of airlines, oversight of, of airports, oversight of manufacturers and components. That could, that's where the real sand might get into the works. And so, as you were mentioning earlier, it also impacts the, the safety checks therein. So what, what type of resumption would we be talking about thereafter? Well, I, I don't think we'll see anything with safety. Hey, look, the airline industry today, they know bad safety is really expensive. So you, you're not going to have that problem. But getting back on, you like, bring up a real good point. When you shut something down, getting it back, getting that in, that FAA inspector back to take a look at that new system that a component manufacturer is putting together might take weeks. So it'll delay a lot of things and, and it will hurt some companies. There's no question about it because they won't be able to produce the, pro, the, the systems they want to produce or, or de develop them, that sort of thing, it could be, again, that's where you got these billions of dollars and millions of dollars a hit. It's not people getting on the airplane at Gate 7 at LaGuardia. All right. Mike Boyd, Boyd Group International President. Mike, always a pleasure to get some of your insights and analysis around this. We'll hope that we don't get to that point, but uh, you may be getting another call from us. <laughs> Love to. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All your markets action straight ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
New home sales dipped in August compared to the revised July rates, down 8.7% as rising mortgage rates weigh on home buyers. Meanwhile, home prices continue to trend upward amid low inventory. Case Shiller's home index and it shows 19 of the 20 major metro markets reported month-over-month -month price increases in July. Joining us now, we've got Jeff Tucker, Zillow Senior Economist. All right, Jeff, we've got a lot to digest here and really trying to wrap our heads around this here. When you think about the broader state of the home market right now and, and where buyers are showing any interest at all, where are you seeing that shift towards where they are even deciding to enter back into the home buying equation? Yeah, that's right. The I think where home shoppers are still buying and still shopping is where they can afford to. And so geographically, that is looking like places in the Midwest, actually, places like Cleveland and Chicago, um, also more affordable markets in the Northeast, like Providence, Rhode Island. These are some of the markets that actually still have pretty strong price growth that showed up in the Case Shiller report today as well. Um, and then sort of in terms of home type, New construction in many ways is more affordable for a lot of today's buyers because builders have been offering very generous buy downs of those mortgage rates as a major concession to kind of make the mortgage math actually work for home buyers when they're looking at the existing home prices and running the numbers on mortgages and, and realizing with mortgage rates now up over 7% that, uh, that they often just can't make it work. So a lot of builders have been able to buy down those rates into the uh, you know the lower sixes or even into the five percent range, so that has really helped builders continue to sell some homes. I think what we saw this month, though, with that August data that just came out this morning, is that even builders are being tested. Do they have enough margin to be able to work with to keep buying those rates down to a point that that makes the math work out for uh, for home buyers? So we did see uh, new construction sales take a step back last month. And the way things are going in September so far with that kind of hawkish Fed forecast and mortgage rates rising further up to flirting with seven and a half percent now, uh, even builders are really getting stretched in their ability to buy down those rates to an affordable level for home buyers right now. Jeff, do you think we'll see rates at eight percent, the 30 year mortgage? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I, I don't think we have that in the data right now. Um, Although I, I think if you kind of step back and look at the, you know, the revisions, uh, sort of the way the, the yield curve has stepped up and up and up over the course of the last year, if that continues to happen, if we get another few step ups like that, 8% um, is certainly in shooting distance. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, at the, at the moment, I, I don't see anything to kind of push us to that level. But Unfortunately, I, I really don't see anything in the data to point the other direction of much reason to expect rates to come down very quickly anytime soon. We're still digesting this 4.5% 10 year treasury yield. Um, that's, that's very high. That's going, to, uh, that, that's going to keep pushing those mortgage interest rates up, especially because we know that spread is very high right now. And it seems to be widening further the higher that treasury yields go. Do you? Do you believe that this is going to create a flight from cities just based on a pricing basis here? I mean, for the third straight month, we're looking at Cleveland, Chicago, New York, seeing some of the highest year over year gains among these top 20 cities, these 20 cities that are um, indexed here. So where is this going to create some fallout in some of these regional housing markets? Yeah, so the, this Case Shiller report is, is really interesting because it's telling the story of what happened in the first half of this year where you know, buyer demand was rather low, but the supply of existing homes available for sale was even lower. There were just very few listings of existing homes. That's kind of what was driving this shortage, which created a bit of a frenzy condition in places like New York City. Um, and it, in fact, even brought some price growth back to markets out west, like here in Seattle, um, San Francisco had uh, and uh, Phoenix had some substantial sort of seasonal midsummer price growth this year. So in, in many ways, that kind of lack of supply was really driving the conditions uh, th this summer. That's also what created the opportunity for home builders to step in and meet some of that unmet demand from the existing home market. So, you know, looking ahead, what does all that mean? I, I do think if you look at a market like Dallas, that was one of the big surprises for me in the Case Shiller report was how weak home price appreciation is in Dallas at the moment. 
I think part of the story there is that's a place where builders have been able to build. When you look at new home sales, it's in the South. It's in these big Texas and Florida markets. And that is, that's helping meet buyers where they are. And it does mean that that kind of shortage of existing home inventory doesn't loom as large there. It's not creating those kind of, uh, those kind of frenzied conditions that we're seeing in the Northeast and the Midwest. In those, in those markets, they're much more dominated by the fact that existing homeowners are just hanging on to those 3% mortgage rates they have. They don't want to sell, and that's keeping the supply of existing homes still just incredibly low. Yeah, those rates in the 3% range look a lot more attractive than what you'd be paying if you were buying a new house today, up to up around uh, just over 7%. It's pretty remarkable. All right, J Jeff Tucker, always great to have you. Zillow Senior Economist. Thanks for having me on. Let's do a quick... Of course, let's do a quick check of the markets here as we're about a 90 minutes into the trading day. You're still looking at losses across the board. The Dow still off just over 250 points, so off the lows of the morning. The S&P off about 1% as well as the NASDAQ. All 11 of the S&P sectors are in the red this morning. Some of the biggest decliners, consumer discretionary, technology and communication services among the biggest decliners to the downside. That does it for us today on Yahoo Finance. But keep it right here. Rochelle Kufo, Akiko Fujita joining you for the next hour. See you tomorrow. I'm Rochelle Akufo, alongside Akiko Fujita. Here's a look at what we're watching this morning. First of all, as a government shutdown looms, former Vice President Mike Pence tells Yahoo Finance House Republicans are the last line of defense we'll discuss. 
And Costco earnings are on tap after the bell today. What those results could show investors about the state of the consumer. Plus, President Biden heads to the picket lines as the United Auto Workers strike pushes on. We'll bring you all the updates from Michigan. But first, let's take a look at where the markets are tracking right now. Uh, two hours into the trading day right now, we've got the Dow and the S&P 500 trading pretty flat. The Nasdaq uh, trading flat as well, though the Dow and the Nasdaq dipping in the red. Let's check in on the Treasury market, one we've been watching very closely after the real volatile moves we've seen over the last several sessions. The 10-year yield right now uh, at 4.5%. On the longer end, we've got the 30-year yield at 4.66%. Well, we are just four days away from a government shutdown. No, it is not deja vu again here. The Senate plans to vote on a stopgap spending bill tonight that would keep the government funded after money runs out Saturday at midnight, putting pressure on Speaker Kevin McCarthy to get something passed as he struggles against a few rogue members of his own party. If Congress cannot get a bill on the president's desk, a lot of people could be out of work. Uh, Rochelle, look, we've got uh, House Republicans putting forward additional appropriations bill today, not necessarily because it's going to avert a government shutdown, because House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is trying to buy some goodwill with the more right wing of the party. Uh, that really points to this tenant, ten, uh, really tough position uh, that Kevin McCarthy is in right now, where he's got Republicans in the House GOP threatening to oust him if, in fact, he doesn't go for these additional spending cuts, more aggressive spending cuts as well. But really, at the end of the day, for our viewers, it is about looking at what the impact is going to be come Saturday midnight. It's going to be a lot of services that could be shut down. It's true. I mean, and as we know, Kevin McCarthy was essentially fighting for his life to even get that leadership position. So he's in a very, a very precarious situation at the moment. And when you look at some of the main impacts that we'll see, obviously, we're going to see most federal employees will have to be furloughed. Some essential employees, though, will still have to work, but they won't be paid until the government reopens. And of course, this couldn't come at a worse time. You have Fed tightening now just hitting home for a lot of households here. So this is the last thing you want to have to worry about. And then when you think of some other services, if you want a small business loan, that's going to be affected. If you want to get your passport processed, that's also going to be affected as well. Some of the things that won't be impacted, though, Social Security and Medicare, but things that will be childcare benefits like the Women, Infants and Children program. Now, these are some of the things that obviously speak to people's ability to get to work. If you don't have childcare, how do you show up for work? What's going to happen to your children? So a lot of these things are going to perhaps start trickling out. And it's not just when the shutdown happens. It's also a case of how quickly do these things then get back on track as well. That adds another wrinkle into this, Akiko. And Rochelle, of course, we've been tracking this from a market's perspective. The market's still largely shrugging it off, which has kind of been the reaction in past government shutdowns. But here's a number to leave you with. 21 government shutdowns since 1976. The longest shutdown, of course, under former President Trump. That lasted 34 days. And both sides, both parties certainly not hoping that we lead down that road this time around. Well, Yahoo Finance's Brad Smith, Shauna Smith, and Rick Newman spoke to former vice president and current Republican presidential nominee Mike Pence this morning. Here's what he had to say about the looming government shutdown. First, let me say about the government shutdown. You know, I was, I was a House conservative leader for 12 years, and uh, House Republicans are the last line of defense for taxpayers in Washington, D.C. So I, I encourage the team there and Speaker McCarthy to continue to drive and drive hard for one more down payment on fiscal responsibility and, and putting our nation back on a path toward a balanced budget. Joining us now is Steve Schmidt, political strategist and founder of The Warning Newsletter, YouTube channel and podcast. Uh, Steve, I'm going to put your have you put your strategist hat on here. You heard the former vice president say, look, House Republicans are the last line of defense to put on a down payment for the future. But he didn't have to deal with such a tight majority within the House specifically. How do you think Kevin McCarthy gets out of this bind? I think that the most important thing to recognize is the degree in Mike Pence's statement is, is how much gaslighting is involved in that. Mike Pence was the vice president of the most profligate, biggest spending administration in American history that added more debt more quickly to America's total debt uh, than any other administration ever. Uh, Kevin McCarthy is not a victim here. 
John Kennedy had an admonition in his, in his inaugural, and it was this. He said, to the foolish men who seek power by trying to ride the back of the tiger, be careful because you wind up inside the tiger. And that's what's happened to Kevin McCarthy. This is an act of national vandalism, an act of arson that will impose real hardship on the American people. This is not something that is coming from a mainstream. It's coming from extremists, including from Paul Gosar, that threatened to execute the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff yesterday. So this is part of the ongoing, unfolding story of an extremist movement in America that's assaulting the American government over and over and over again. That's what we're seeing. So then, Steve, if you're a Republican presidential candidate, you're looking at this situation and wondering how to position yourself. I mean, we heard former Vice President Mike Pence putting a lot of the blame for even the situation with inflation on he, he wanted to end the dual mandate by the Fed. He would said he would get rid of, of Fowler, really instead focus on protecting the integrity of the dollar. If you're trying to advise a Republican candidate here, how would you advise them? I would tell most of them to drop out of the race, particularly Mike Pence, since he's at 2 percent in the polls and he has 100 percent name identification. When the first Republican debate took place, there was a question asked, and eight of these candidates raised their hands. And the question was, if Donald Trump is the nominee, will you support him again? Fully aware of the insurrection, the 92 criminal counts, none of these people are particularly credible as candidates. It's clear that the one who has momentum in the race is Nikki Haley. The rest have little chance. And the truth of the matter is none of them have any influence whatsoever on what's going on in the House of Representatives. So where does that leave the party, Steve? I feel like that's always where the conversation goes when we're talking about this with you. I mean, you, going back to your earlier comments, you, you said this is an extremist party assaulting the American government. What is the way out of this? And if you're the House Speaker, do you then take the risk and go across the aisle to try and avert a government shut shutdown, even if that could threaten your post? Kevin McCarthy has demonstrated no willingness ever to take a stand that puts principle over politics that may cost him anything. There's no evidence of it. This is a person on January 6th. Liz Cheney has told the nation this that understood the role that Donald Trump played, but within a week was at Mar-a-Lago resuscitating Donald Trump. So in this moment, the American people have an enormous question in, in front of them. Uh, yesterday, a former president who controls Kevin McCarthy's party, lock, stock, and barrel, said that he was coming after the American media. Does he mean it? Do you assess him as meaning it? Because what he said is he's taking NBC off the air. He called for the execution of an American four-star general who's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. This isn't a Kardashians episode. This is real life. This man stands on the edge of regaining power. We're the oldest constitutional republic in the world and the Republican Party, the party of Eisenhower, the party of Lincoln, has succumbed and become, through a mix of cowardice and cynicism, uh, the appendage to this autocratic movement. And, and so the threshold question, as we move four days into a government shutdown, are the things that were said yesterday seriously yeah. said? Did the people mean them? And there's no evidence to suggest that whether it's Trump or so, Gosar or 10 other extremists in this caucus, that they don't mean it. They mean it. I mean, Steve, you point, uh, you paint a pretty grim picture of the current Republican Party. And yet the very man who shaped it, you could argue, the former president, is still well ahead of the pack when it comes to the 2024 presidential race. Why do you think he's still polling so well? Well, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, you have a grievance-based candidacy in a country where 60 percent of the country lives paycheck to paycheck, 40 percent of them don't have $400, tens of millions of people are unbanked, 
lack access to a checkbook savings account. And Donald Trump is a world-class demagogue who documentedly lied to the American people during his administration 35,000 times. And we know from political history that in times of chaos, in times of disruption, uncertainty, when everything seems to be falling over, what's up is down and what's down is up, what appeals to people politically is somebody who can communicate, I will bring back order. So the strongman candidacy is something that is always potent in times of uncertainty, and that's politically what we're seeing amidst this great and vast sea of apathy that takes all of these events, places them into a silo, and disconnects them from what immediately happened before it and what immediately is going to follow it. And I know we'll certainly see a lot of the, the blame game going around, especially as we head into the debates as well. Appreciate you, as always, joining us. Political strategist Steve Schmidt, right. thank you so much. Well, the U.S. dollar has been a safe haven for investors amid the cratering bond market and government shutdown fears. And we rely on the Fed to keep the value of the dollar high. Here is what former Vice President Mike Pence had to say about how the Fed is playing that role. I would absolutely go in a different direction with the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Fresh leadership at the Fed. We ought to focus Federal Reserve on protecting the integrity of the dollar. So let's bring in our very own Jared Blickery here. So, Jared, what are we seeing right now in the currency market? We've seen a strengthening dollar, and uh, I'll just go on the record here saying it's really not the Federal Reserve's purview to enact a strong dollar policy. They have to worry about employment and inflation, and if a strong dollar happens to support that, well, I would think they would too. But <clears throat> let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive, where we can chart the price action in the Dixie or the U.S. dollar index over the last two months, and you're going to see it's from the lower left to the upper right. That is a very strengthening move, and as we know, uh, the strong dollar dollar tends to weigh on the results of multinational corporations, but it also does have some benefits as well, especially when uh, the country that holds a reserve status in the world uh, also has their capital markets in tow. So um, let me just go to a chart that I prepared here uh, that shows when the dollar is really surging high and when 10-year yields are surging. So the red dots are when the dollar is overbought, and this is laid over a chart of the S&P 500 going back two years. And then I have in blue dots when the yields are overbought. And if they're both overbought at the same time on the same day, it's a purple dot. What I want you to notice is that most of these dots, most of the strong dollar is happening on the down strokes. And this was especially prevalent last year. We got some on the, on the little bitty upstrokes here. But for the most part, since we've had this rally off of the October lows, we don't have a lot of red or blue dots. That means that we haven't had to deal with a surging yield market or a surging dollar market. But that has changed. You can see recently a bunch of red dots there. That means the dollar has been getting a little bit overbought. And when it moves too quickly, it's not about the levels. It's really about the speed of the movement. Uh, that kind of rattles uh, risk markets because institutions that have to move around large bonds amounts of money and manage them, well, they can't deal with volatility as easily as a retail investor. So back to the main point, here's the US dollar index again over the last two months. Uh, but I want to show you over the last year, because essentially it was trading sideways for most of this time, and it only recently broke to the upside. And given the consolidation here, the length of the consolidation, I got to think that it's going to head materially higher, unless there's a huge change in circumstances here. I want to close by showing a heat map of the U.S. dollar index versus all the crosses around the world. Well, not all of them, but most of them. This is on a one-month basis, and all the green means that the U.S. dollar has strengthened over the last month various, against these various currencies. In the upper left, we have the Turkish lira. The U.S. dollar is up 5.2 percent. Then we have the Mexican peso. Then we have the British, British pound. Then we have the Swiss franc, the euro, the Japanese yen. So this is a really interesting mix of not only developing market currencies, but also developed market currencies. And it just goes to show you um, the strength in play here. The U.S. dollar will rise not only because of safe haven values, but also because of interest rate differentials. And that's what we're dealing with right here, the higher for long Longer, people want to buy dollars so they can invest in our yields, which are surging higher. So it's kind of a virtuous loop there. Some would say not so virtuous. Depends on which side of the trade you're on.
Jared Blickery, can always count on you for a bit of a lesson, history lesson, I should say, in the dollar. Thanks so much for that. Well, let's, let's take a look at one trending ticker we are watching closely today, and that is Tesla. Shares down just slightly here. As the Financial Times reports, it will join some European car makers in facing an EU anti-subsidy probe over Chinese exports. Uh, specifically, Rochelle, the EU, looking at whether, in fact, the Chinese are providing unfair subsidies. And this, of course, the broader context is this record trade deficit that we have seen between the EU and China. We're talking roughly $400 billion dollars last year alone, the EU looking specifically at the EV market because it is such a big export spot for these Chinese car makers too. And of course, Tesla making most of the headlines there just because of the amount of Chinese made vehicles that it's exported, especially from its Shanghai factory during the first seven months of the year. According to um, Schmidt Automotive Research, Tesla sold an estimated 93,700 vehicles from there. The next uh, biggest exporter after that was SA SAIC's MG. So that's why Tesla kind of got caught up in this. But it, obviously, it isn't just Tesla. There's also BYD, NEO, Xpeng as well, really looking at the exports that they've been making to Western Europe. And Europe really trying to, to try and level the playing field here and looking at if and to what degree some of these exports have been subsidized. Yeah, one fifth of all EVs sold in Europe coming from China. So that number is certainly something that EU is, is looking for to see whether, in fact, as you say, the playing field is leveled. Indeed. Well, we still have all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. There's always hope, and uh, I don't believe, believe in a no-win scenario. Like, we understand what, what a shutdown means uh, to the government, to the American people. Uh, I certainly do not want that. Uh, and so we also have some other Republicans on the more moderate side that uh, certainly don't want that. It's an interesting situation. I hope that uh, during this weekend, we can come to some solution and come back and work it through. The odds of a shutdown are increasing. Modern, mature governments should not be shutting down. Uh, it's uh, certainly a crazy impact, probably an impact on the markets, an impact on the economy, an impact on all of the government operations essential to keep uh, society humming along. And right now, the House is talking about going out for five days and coming back next Tuesday. And at that point, they would just have till midnight Saturday to work out a continuing resolution. So uh, things are looking worse than they did a couple days ago. The real problem right now is Speaker McCarthy uh, continues to be really um, led around uh, by a very far right uh, extreme contingent in his caucus. Um, look, at the end of the day, uh, if Speaker McCarthy agrees to put up for a vote in the House, the kind of bipartisan proposals that we're sending from the Senate, I'm confident that they would pass. Uh, the question is whether um, he will put the country before his own interests uh, and, and move forward in that way.
Let's do a check of the market sponsored by Tasty Trade. Looking at a mixed picture so far this morning, the Dow, they're relatively flat, but down about nine points. The S&P 500, they're eking out some gains, up about two and a half points on the day. Tech heavy Nasdaq there, also just barely in the red. Saw some weak economic data as August home sales missed expectations and consumer confidence also fell in September versus August. Well, as we wrap up September, a notoriously bad month for markets, we want to know, is there anything to look forward to in October? For more on what we can expect from markets and inflation, we have Octavio Morenzi, CEO of Opimus, joining us so far. So good to have you on the show here. A lot of people willing to put September behind us, especially we're coming into this rough final week here. What do they have to look forward to in October? Well, I hate to be a harbinger of bad news, but I'm afraid not much. It looks like it's going to be more of the same. I think the real headline story at the moment is what is going to happen with inflation? What is the Fed going to do in terms of interest rates? Now, Jamie Dimon recently uh, mentioned that he thought if the Fed increased interest rates all the way to 7%, that's going to be very, very bad for the US economy. Now, it's the first time I've heard a big bank CEO talk about interest rates going that high. We're only at 5.5% at the moment, and there's talk of about another 25 basis point increase this year, then basically nothing. But um, I think if that does happen, I think it's likely to happen. The Fed will be forced to push in that direction as inflation continues. We see gas and energy prices sustain a high level. We're going to see the Fed forced into action again. And I expect them to have to continue to in increase interest rates. And that's going to be a damper on the market. And I think that's what we're seeing a lot of nervousness about right now is that prospect that the Fed is not going to be able to, even in 2024, start to cut interest rates, that it's going to have to carry on increasing and that's going to be a really bad damper on the co in, on the markets in particular and on tax, tech stocks most especially. So I think that's really what we have to look forward for the next few months, the next six to 12 months even. Uh, Octavio, you know, you talk about where the Fed is right now. At the same time, we've seen a number of headwinds that are on the horizon. The UAW strike that's playing out right now. You've got this student um, loan payments resuming as well. And then, of course, a government shutdown that is looming just four days away here. To what extent is, is that likely to shake up the markets as well? Or, or do you see the Fed as is just continuing to, the, to be the primary driver? Uh, well, obviously, those, those things are negative in terms of the market. In terms of the shutdown, I think we've gone through this a few times. We've seen shutdowns. Uh, we remember shutdowns in the past. It seems the most dramatic thing that comes out of it is that you're not able to visit the Washington Memorial on that particular day. And other than that, sort of the economy just bounces through it. Uh, everyone gets paid retroactively. Uh, and you go sort of back to work once the Congress gets uh, comes to its senses and finds a way out of the sort of the, the corner that they back themselves into. So I don't think the shutdown is really weighing on the markets that heavily, uh, unless it really starts to take a bad turn and start to risk a default on the US debt. But I think that's so far away. I don't think anyone's really seriously considering that at this stage. But I don't think the markets are going to really be too concerned about the government shutdown. I think that will come back. Now, the UAW strike, obviously, for those companies involved in it, yes, that's going to be a, a serious issue. I don't think the Fed is going to intervene in terms of that. But I do think the Fed is the most important game in town in terms of where markets are going. And that's what we've seen over the course of the past six months, basically. I think we've seen a, a sort of a run up in the markets that, that ebbed away a bit in September, but basically was predicated on the idea that the Fed had finished its, its rate hikes and was going to start to cut, uh, start to cut interest rates at least sometime in 2024. But I think that's receding further and further into the future as we see high energy prices persist that is not going to be possible, I think. I think the Fed is going to basically have to resume increasing interest rates rather than cutting them anytime soon, anytime in the foreseeable future. And Octavia, as we look at the performance of the 10-year yield here, looking at, at some of the 2007 highs, it's been flashing recession signals. Is that the best signal to follow when you're trying to figure out what the markets are going to do uh, going forward? Obviously, you have the VIX currently above 18 as well. So a lot of volatility, and we're seeing this flight to safety in the 10-year. Well, I guess a very reliable indicator of whether we're going to see a recession coming is basically the inversion of the yield curve, basically when short-term interest rates go above long-term ones. And we've seen that for some time now. Now, it has been said that the inversion of the yield curve has accurately forecast six of the seven last recessions or something of that sort. But it's a fairly firm indicator because so much is dependent on interest rates. So as the Fed increases short-term interest rates, all sorts of industries that are dependent on that knowingly or unknowingly start to suffer. Real estate is the most obvious one. We saw the weak housing sales come in now as a result, I think, of higher mortgage rates. And those mortgage rates seem to be going higher and higher, uh, not very quickly, modestly, mod at a moderate rate. But that's going to put a damper on that. So I think that's a very, very good indicator of where we're going to go. As you see that kind of inversion, we've seen that inversion now for several months in terms of the yield curve. That's going to have a very negative effect 
of all sorts of different industries, in particular the banking industry, their lending capacity is going to be constrained as a result of that, and that's going to reverberate through the economy. So I think that's a fairly reliable indicator. I'm actually somewhat surprised we haven't seen that mm-hmm. impact the economy just yet, but I think that's still in the works. That's been a very reliable indicator in the past of some of a recession to come. So I think that's really what's in the cards now as well. Octavio, from a strategy standpoint, what are the sectors that provide some protection in this uncertain environment? Well, look, I think very short-term U.S. Treasuries are, are yielding over 5% now. So you can buy all the way out to six-month U.S. Treasuries, and they're yielding over 5%. And because they're so short-term, you don't really run any interest rate risk. For those people who back in 2022 thought a good place to park their money was in bonds and government bonds and long-dated bonds, they got sorely disappointed as, as a result of basically the value of their bonds being eaten away by higher, higher interest rates. When you're at the very short end of things, that doesn't really matter. You're going to get the money back very, very quickly. So you're not as exposed to changes in interest rates. So I think the very short end of the yield curve, the, the one to six months are looking really good. I can't remember a time when you could get 5% return for basically doing nothing and taking no risk at all. So I think that's a very attractive investment at the moment. Um, I think we've been advising people to sort of sit at the short end of the yield curve and, and, and wait there until things look better, until we can see a concerted move by the central banks to basically start to cut interest rates again. Okay, and that could be a while if they're waiting there. Octavio Morenzi, Opima CEO, it's good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Well, we've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You are watching Yahoo Finance Live. We'll be right back. Liberty Media proposing a merger with SiriusXM today. The deal would create a spin-off of the two companies and publicly list the merged conglomerate called 
new Sirius XM. Liberty Media saying it offered Sirius XM's board to split its shares and current shareholders would receive shares of the spinoff. Liberty Media already owns roughly 83 percent of the radio company. Sirius XM said it was evaluating the offer. Well, as we speak, President Joe Biden is on his way to the picket line. The president will stand in solidarity with the United Auto Workers Union, becoming the first sitting U.S. president to visit workers on strike. Also joining auto workers, former President Trump will be holding a rally with current and former union members in Michigan tomorrow. So, of course, while he's doing that, uh, former President uh, Trump will not be at the GOP debates, instead choosing to to still focus on Detroit here. I mean, this is an, an interesting time. Obviously, President Biden known for being very pro-union here. And it was interesting that when we had former Vice President Pence on the show, he actually blamed Bidenomics for, for part of the reason that workers are striking uh, right now, which is interesting because from a lot of the analysts that we've spoken to, it's been about some of the concessions that workers made during the 2008 financial crisis, when a lot of the big three were bailed out here, plus obviously inflation and other cost of living expenses as well. So it'll be interesting to see how President Biden is received and, and really how this plays out for him politically as well, Akiko. Yeah, there's two threads I think are really interesting to be following here with the president set to land in Detroit just a little afternoon today. On the one hand, it is about these two, some would argue, conflicting uh, policies that the president is pushing. He has promised strong labor jobs in this transition to EVs. And you, you hear the big three, these car makers who say, look, what you are asking for UAW workers is just not realistic given the sheer scale of investment that's necessary uh, in this EV transition. At the same time, you're seeing President Trump or former President Trump as well as President Biden go towards the picket lines there because it is about trying to get that working class vote. Michigan, obviously a swing state. And if you look ahead to next year, I mean, you think back to 2016, that's the time when the former president won Michigan, uh, President Biden won Michigan in 2020. So uh, this is politically a very important region for either side to capture. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, visually, though, first time the president, a sitting president, has walked with a union on the picket lines. You know, is he going to pick up a sign and walk the line? I mean, I think people are going to be looking for any cues on that front. It's true. And as, as you mentioned, I mean, some of uh, President Biden's critics might say, look, you're, you're being hypocritical here. You're pushing for all this investment in EVs. That means a lot, a lot more investment that some of these companies have to make. And perhaps they can't afford some of these price increases. So it'll be a delicate balancing act that the president's going to have to do. And if he is, the, you know, obviously picking up a sign that might perhaps fly in the face of what he's trying to push with EVs. And, you know, the big three might shrug their shoulders and be like, well, the money has to come from somewhere. Yeah, I mean, the argument from the White House will be, of course, that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Both policies can move forward. But we will, of course, be watching very closely as these two face off, so to speak, in Detroit. Well, let's take a look at where shares of Costco are trading this morning, down about three-tenths of a percent as a wholesaler prepares to report earnings after the bell today. Investors will look for insight into how the company is faring as consumers become increasingly Cautious. Joining us now with more on what to watch, Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma with a preview. Brooke. Good morning, Kiko. That's right. Costco is set to give investors an inside look at consumer spending power with Costco's earnings set to report after the bell today. Now, we know that same-source sales are expected to get a boost as those inflation-weary consumers might have went to Costco because of those cheaper gas prices. Same-source sales expected to jump 1.8 percent and excluding fuel and FX, that sales growth is expected to be even higher. Foot traffic also expected to get a boost up 2.5 percent. Now, according to the traffic data analytics company Placer.ai, throughout the summer in June, July, and August, the traffic was up at Costco compared to its wholesale retail competitors. The traffic at Costco in July jumping as much as 4.5 percent compared to its competition with only saw a boost of up 0.4 percent. Evercore analysts is saying in a recent note, further appreciation of fuel prices could provide an additional traffic as well as same source sales growth and share tailwind to further highlight the loyalty model. Of course, we know that consumers often turn to Costco for value in inflationary weary times. E-commerce is also something that Yahoo Finance is keeping a close eye on. Analysts on the street expect that to get a boost of 5% as we saw so many consumers turn away 
from those big ticket items in past quarters and even in recent months. But what we do know is that many analysts are looking to Costco as, you know, macro uncertainties remain, lots of headwinds up against the consumers. We often see in times like this, consumers turn to Costco to score those deals. And so, Brooke, with that in mind, you mentioned that increase uh, in foot traffic then, and we're also watching membership prices. What are the expectations there? Right. Well, uh, Costco CFO has largely said that they hope to remain a beacon of light for consumers in uncertain times like this. But we know historically now would be around the time that Costco would raise membership fees. They last raised them back in 2017, and the company tends to raise them every five years and seven months. Now, Wall Street expects membership fee revenues. That's a key indicator for the company to come in at $1.46 billion. But like I said before, the Costco Gold membership now stands at $60 per year. For an executive membership, it now stands at $120 per year. And CFO Richard Galanti said last quarter that the team feels very good that it could increase membership fees without impacting in any meaningful way renewal rates or signups or anything. But they said right now that they have enough drivers to really leverage the business right now. And so yet to be seen whether or not we'll hear more on the call later on today. Indeed. We'll have to see if they raise any prices on those good hot dog deals they always have as well, especially customers looking to really stretch their dollar at the moment. A big appreciation there for our very own Brooke De Palma. All right, now for today's chart of the day. As consumers stay increasingly cost conscious, it's been a tough year for luxury stocks. Shares in French luxury giant LVMH, Cartier owner Richemont, and Gucci parent company Kering have all nearly erased their year to date gains. And that trend isn't expected to reverse anytime soon. Morgan Stanley lowering its organic growth and 2024 profit forecast for most luxury companies, warning that demand could soften in both China and European markets. Morgan Stanley's Edouard Aubin downgraded Richemont to equal weight while also lowering his price targets for LVMH and Kering as well. I mean, a lot of people wondering when we were going to see some of that luxury market, those, those luxury consumer spenders start to bite a little bit, starting to see those cracks, especially when it comes to Chinese consumers, Akiko. Yeah, and that's going to be a tough headwind for these brands, especially going into what is typically the busiest shopping um, season of the year. But you're right to point out the headwinds that we have seen in China. You know, you go back to where we were at the first, you know, the, the first half of the year, the expectation that there would be a bounce back in that market, which has been so important for these luxury brands. That just hasn't happened. And we've heard more and more that consumers are getting increasingly cautious Yes, last year we were talking about the resilience of the luxury brand, but it feels like that has really started to trickle over into some of these names. It's true. And even this idea of stealth wealth, perhaps people not wanting to be quite as showy at the moment. We're seeing a lot of sort of premium goods that don't necessarily have all the logos splashed across them. So perhaps some consumer trends to watch in terms of what they're spending on, as well as them being more discretionary as well. I don't know, Rochelle, if you're spending that money, I think consumers still want that branding out there, but we'll see. I, I am not the one that's spending thousands of dollars uh, on some of these products, so not one to speak. That's true. Same here. I, I might treat myself a little bit for the most part. Yeah, that's, that's not <laughs> what my budget is looking at. Well, we still have all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance.
Retirement savings are a big concern for some, with a new study from Schroeder showing only 29% of millennials believe they will save at least $1 million for a comfortable retirement. Our next guest, though, says spelling out her 12 investing rules to help you turn that around. Nancy Tengler is Laffler Tengler Investment CEO and CIO. She joins us now. Uh, Nancy, good to talk to you today. What's at the top of that list? Akiko, thanks for having me. Yeah, so in my book, The Women's Guide to Successful Investing, I write about uh, 12 investment rules. The first one is, and this is particularly true for women, that most women don't take, the risk is that they don't take enough risk. And that's in fact uh, proven out by the data, but it's also just our nature. We tend to be savers and less investors. And the irony is, Akiko, that we make better investors than men, according to the research. So I, I, I'm really compelled to, to communicate, particularly to with millennial women who seem to be deferring their decisions to their their what we call the money spouse more than my generation, the baby boomers. So Nancy, you raise an interesting point here because I mean we have all this information at our fingertips, more tools than ever to be you know more uh, literate about our finances, about our investment. Why then are the millennial women predominantly then shifting that responsibility to their to their spouses? Yeah, so Rochelle, I mean, that is the question, but I think there are a couple of reasons. So the baby boomers came of age with the 401k, so we had to participate in the investment process during the 90s when stocks were were really um, strong and we were in a, in a sustained bull market. Uh, the millennials kind of grew up during the 2000, 2000 and, um, sorry, 2008, 2009 period when they watched their parents' retirement get cut by 35 to 40%. And so there was um, a real trepidation about approaching the markets. That changed somewhat during the pandemic. Uh, we had a lot of millennials entering into trading, uh, some, some meme stock trading, which I'm not as crazy about. But in general, I think they're starting to embrace it. And of course, then just getting older uh, and you start thinking, oh, geez, I better save for my kid's retirement, uh, kid's college or my retirement. So I, I think there's a couple of reasons. My mission is to make, make sure that all women feel equipped to participate in the investment decision because the average age of a divorce for a woman, the first divorce is 30 in the U.S., and the average age of a widow is 59, which seems way too young to me. And so women need to be you know, engaged in the process. And, and Nancy, you know, what was so interesting to me when looking through your notes is the fact that you said women make better investors. I mean, what specifically, not to paint all women with the same brush, but what specifically are you pointing to? Well, the, re the research shows that first and foremost, women do more research, but secondarily, they're less competitive with an index. So the original study on this was Boys Will Be Boys by Barbara and Odeen. And what they found was that on average, real life portfolios, women outperformed men over a 10 year period by about 1%. They outperformed single men by about 4%. So that's why one of my rules is remain dispassionate but diligent because when you're buying a stock most anyone particularly a stock that's out of favor most anyone can tell you what's wrong with it so in 2012 when i was buying apple the story was or 2013 2012 and 2013 um, that that tim cook was no steve jobs uh, then they had the google maps debacle it was only a handset company but what i noticed was the service business and most importantly i was teaching college at the time and I didn't see a PC in any of my classrooms. They were all Macs. So that's anecdotal that drove me to do the research while the experts were saying, you know, this, this company is dead, dead money. And so if women pay attention and do their research, they can set and, and let, you know, not look back on many of these, many of these stocks that I'm advocating are stocks you can own for a lifetime. And Nancy, uh, talk about some of those stocks, because obviously you, you're at a time when we've seen tech stocks really drive the rally so far this year, but you're getting a lot of warning signals from recession. You have these higher for longer interest rate environment that we're going to be in. In your 40 years as a portfolio manager, then how do you sort of brace for this sort of higher for longer interest rate period? Well, so this is a normal interest rate environment, Rochelle, for most of my investing career. And real interest rates are only a little above 2%. During the 90s, they they sort of um, bounced around between 2 to 4.5% real interest rates I'm talking about, so after inflation. So I don't, I don't think that this is um, a dangerous time for stocks. The market's recalibrating. You've got 
other issues I think that are affecting it. I'm actually more concerned about the strong dollar. But here's what I can tell you. Uh, in 2007, I bought Starbucks after it had declined from 40 to like $31 a share. Uh, the, the stock ran up pretty dramatically after that because Howard Schultz came back. I think that was the second time. Um, and, and the company uh, was, was, you know, firing on all cylinders. He kind of cleaned things up. And then we got the recession and the stock went down to a bottom of about $7.81. I didn't sell it. I didn't buy more. I was busy at that point um, going to graduate school, driving carpool. I'd left the business for a few years. And, and I'm glad I didn't because since that time, the stock has outperformed the S&P. It's up about 18.1% annualized versus the S&P, which is up something like 10 or 12. Um, so those numbers may not be right. You'll have to get the book to <laughs> everyone to read it because I can't remember it precisely. But when you buy a great company with a great management team, with a with a strong brand and franchise, that's that's where you can kind of set back. It doesn't always ring true. Almost always though, however, in my experience, those companies figure it out. IBM may have been the exception, but even there, I bought a share for my son when he was born. That was 35 years ago. And he um it's up about 11, 1,200% just under. And, you know, it's not kept up with the market, but that's not too shabby compared to a bank account return. And Nancy, and Nancy yeah. just quickly, I mean, you put in your notes that 95% of women will be their family's primary financial decision maker at some point in their lives. The biggest mistake that you see women make, perhaps, obviously they're, they're not a monolith, but the biggest mistake you tend to see when they do become the sole uh, financial breadwinner. Well, I think they get frustrated typically because they don't have, in general, I mean, some of these are generalizations, but they don't have a relationship with their advisor. And so they, they let it go too long or because they don't have that relationship, they two thirds of women fire their advisor when they take over and that's expensive and disruptive. So I would encourage women, the mistake was already made, I guess, uh, Rochelle, I would encourage women to get involved now. I, I meet women my own age don't even know the password. Uh, to, to the accounts. That, that's ridiculous. Um, I, I was 59 when my husband passed away. It's way too early. And I, I was, you know, there was a lot going on. Happily, I'd always managed the money, but the, it, it's time to get engaged now, not when you're in the grieving period or when, you know, you're older and you feel like you don't have as much control. Women tell me all the time, this is the second edition of the book. After the first edition, I met a lot of women in speaking engagements who said, my advisor now respects me. That, uh, that's what I, I hope for. We certainly hope so, too. Appreciate you taking the time to join us and congratulations on the book. Nancy Tengler, Laffer Tengler Investments, CEO and CIO. Appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, Michelle. All right. All your act, act, markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Nissan unveiled its first fully electric vehicle since the popular Leaf earlier this year. Meet the Nissan Aria, the company's first fully electric crossover SUV. With a starting price of $43,190, does Nissan's latest foray give it a leg up in the EV race? Yahoo Finance's Price to Brumadian and Rick Newman are standing by with their review. Looking, looking forward to this. It looked a little bit like a, like a Nissan Rogue, though. Yeah, a little, a little bit like that. We'll get into that, that, <laughs> that external kind of design there. You know, Nissan sort of delaying this Aria for a year because of the supply chain pandemic crisis, the parts crisis, but now it's here. Rick and I had the chance to drive it. So Rick, I wanted to kind of ask you about, you know, exterior wise, have, have we kind of gone past the super, super futuristic spaceship look and gone to more regular looking EVs here? Yeah, I mean, so Rochelle, I think Rochelle got it right. And that's what Nissan wants Rochelle to say is it does look like models that are in their existing lineup. There's nothing odd or weird about about these EVs. And look, you and I like EVs. Uh, I mean, we've driven a bunch of them. We like the way they drive. We like one pedal driving. We like the torque. Um, we, we, I mean, they're generally designed well. I think it's no longer a question of are they good cars to drive. The question is, are they sellable? Uh, are they marketable in the right way? And do they have the right features and crucially the right price to get people to buy them? And I think we have some doubts about the, how do you say the name again? Aria. Aria. <laughs> Aria. I mean, I just, I mean, I know how to say it, but I struggle over that name and I don't, that, it's such a wispy name. I don't, uh, it just like evaporates in the air. I don't really get the name. Yeah, I, I agree. The name's a little bit clunky there, a little bit uh, uh, awkward. Uh, my, in my short time with the car, and we and I drove it together, I, I thought it was totally adequate. So this is the front wheel drive version of the car, around 240 horsepower ish, almost 300 miles of range. Uh, I thought it looked it looked good on the outside. It didn't didn't strike me as anything too crazy, but I thought it drove comfortably, very smooth, very quiet. A, a nice luxurious interior for a Nissan, in my opinion, a very upscale. And I think they did a great job. But I think Rick, what we're talking about here is the cost. With the price to match, fifty three thousand nice dollars yeah. as tested. It starts at forty three. You're not going to get the forty three thousand dollars car. Fifty three thousand dollars. No EV tax credit. What do you say? what do you think about that? I, I mean, this is this is a huge problem. So this this car starts at a seventy five hundred dollar price disadvantage, and this is complicated, but for everybody, cars have to have a certain percentage of U.S. content to qualify for those tax credits. That includes leases, um, and this one doesn't. It's made in Japan, and uh, Nissan began designing this before those uh, that law ever passed, so they're stuck with it. I did notice one cool thing when I was looking at the website. You in New York, which is where we are and where I live, you don't have to get get an emissions. Uh, certificate every year, which you pay for, or, or else you get a $65 ticket for. So that's one good thing about EVs, but that will not go far toward offsetting the loss of that $7,500. I will say the, the Aria had a nice sort of that floating sort of design with that the console that kind of goes back and forth. Pretty cool little party trick there, but not enough to sort of compensate for that $7,500 loss because of that EV tax credit. Uh, Akiko, I know that you are an EV owner. I know you have a competing EV that I think might, might actually be better, <laughs> but unfortunately it comes with the baggage. What do you think about this car? What do you think about EV ownership in general? Yeah, I mean, it's the infrastructure, right? In fact, you, I just saw that Electrify America and it just, it's so frustrating to have to look for a charger. That's the bigger concern. But, you know, I'd be curious to, to watch the two of you in that car sort of talk about it because, as you know, I mean, Japanese car makers have not been at the forefront of this EV race. In, in Nissan, you know, they were kind of ahead in the beginning with the Leaf, but they've sort of fallen behind. So uh, we'll be very curious to see your review. Of course, you can all see it online. Pros and Rick back in the car together. Thanks so much for that, guys. Thank you. That's it for now. I'm Akiko Fujita along with Rochelle Akupo. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.